Is aware of any apologies? No. Okay. Agenda item two, chairperson's business. Can I ask the committee um, to record its thanks uh, to frontline workers in education and childcare sectors for their ongoing work and commitment uh, to children and families uh, in, in the current COVID-19 lockdown restrictions? The members agreed? Agreed, yes. Agreed. Okay. Okay. Our draft minutes. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 29th of April 2020 at page 6 and seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Can I, in uh, terms of matters arising, can I seek members' agreement to formally adopt the revised agenda, which is in tabled items? and which now includes a briefing from the child care sector. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. And can I refer <coughs> members to the general record of the informal meeting of the 4th of May in tabled items? Uh, remind members that in line with Standing Order 115, it has already been agreed that this is a complete and accurate record of proceedings and confirm with members they are content to note the general record. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Okay, members, there are no other matters arising. And we'll move to agenda item five, uh, our briefing from the child care representatives. Can I remind members that following the informal meeting on Monday the 4th of May with the child care sector, the Education Committee agreed to revise its agenda in order to allow the important issues that were raised to be discussed in public session. And additional briefing from the child care sector has therefore been added to your packs. Can I direct members to tabled items where a paper from the child care sector representatives has been provided? And also in tabled papers, Assembly Research has provided a summary document on child care support measures in different jurisdictions. The correspondence which the committee has recently sent on this subject to relevant ministers is also tabled. Can I confirm there that therefore then that we have Pauline Walmsley? Chief Executive of Early Years, Patricia Loosley Mooney, CBE, Chief Executive of the Northern Ireland Child Minders Association, and Philip Delgetty from the Northern Ireland Daycare Owners. You're all with us? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. By, by way of welcome, can I advise witnesses that the committee agreed to write to the Minister of Health and the Minister of Education asking for a briefing from officials and setting out concerns relating to uh, communications, uh, differences and uh, deficiencies between the child care support package available in Northern Ireland and that apparently available in other jurisdictions, including uh, more wide-ranging qualifying criteria, uh, and invite uh, you as witnesses to brief the Education Committee in public session uh, in more detail about the issues facing the child care sector and the problems with the support package in order to inform the committee's response to the departments uh, on this matter. Can I also start by saying a very, very clear thank you on behalf of the Education Committee to all our highly valued and dedicated childcare key workers across Northern Ireland for the key role you're playing in the development of our children and our economy, especially during COVID-19 and for the role that you will play in recovery from COVID-19. And I assure you that the purpose of our session today is to keep us as informed as possible, to do all we can to make sure you get the support that you need to perform that key role. So thank you very much indeed. Um, and can I invite our witnesses to make short uh, open <coughs> comments, please? Thank you. Um, okay, Chris, well, I'll, I'll maybe go ahead and just to let the committee know, Pauline Walmsley, Chief Executive for Early Years, but my comments I'm also making on behalf of Playboard, the organisation which works with school-age childcare. Um, and I suppose, first of all, Chris, to acknowledge the, the comments that you've, that you've made and to acknowledge the work that the committee has been doing and various members of the committee as we all work together to meet the current and future needs of children and families. 
and particularly against the background where both early childhood and school age childcare settings are under enormous financial pressure at this point in time due to falling numbers. And Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Paul, can I just, yeah, just pause you there for a second. You're, you're not coming through particularly clearly. Is it uh, possible to either speak somewhat more loudly um, or hold your device uh, closer to you? Okay, um, I've kind of got the device as close as I can. The difficulty is I'm calling from Fermanagh, so we're not sometimes great on, on our broadband and stuff, but uh, is that any better, Chris? It's still, it's still quite faint. Um, I, do you have a landline available to you? No. Um, yes. It might, uh, it, it might be it might be worth trying the landline if you want me to briefly bring in someone else and then we can come back to you. Okay. Can I can I just check is that an improvement? It, it's still quite faint. Are, are okay. other members hearing clearly? And uh, not particularly no. no. Okay. Look, look. I need to move then and go to the landline. Apologies okay. about well, look, that. Let okay. me bring. Thank let me bring. Let me. Yeah. Bye. Let me bring Patricia in, and then we'll come back to you. Or sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you very Thanks. much, sir. Uh, my name is Patricia Lucy Minnie, and I'm the chief executive of Northern Ireland Childminding Association. And again, like Paul, I want to acknowledge my thanks to the committee for all the work that it has done on this, and in particular, given us the opportunity to brief the committee today. Um, I suppose I would like to start with just the fact that of the number of childminders that we have in Northern Ireland that has declined over the last four years. And uh, so we've about 2,700, and that equates to about 16,200 children. Um, the, one of the biggest issues during this COVID-19 is that there are only about 438 childminders now minding the children of, of, of key workers and, and those vulnerable children. And one of the biggest things is that many relationships have now broken down between childminders and the parents. And at the end of all of this then is the effect that will have on the children that have been minded. And that's true probably to the situation that many childminders have found themselves in with regard to being self-employed and the fact that they had no income. And the only avenues open to them then were that uh, of universal credit. But obviously if they had a partner or husband or wife that earned more than 16,000 pounds, that made them exempt from getting any kind of payment. And the only other route for them then was the employment support allowance. And again, unless they can prove they were ineligible for work through health grounds, they were exempt from that too. So a lot of childminders feel that they have been, for want uh, of a better word, and to repeat what a childminder said, discriminated against. Because unlike the rest of the sector, like the day sector and the after schools, where staff could be furloughed and get 80% of their salary, or where there was an approved home child care they set up, set up specifically for that daycare sector, and maybe even some of those daycares still being able to claim overhead. Childminders have nothing, and many of them at the minute find themselves on their knees uh, because maybe their husbands are self employed too in small businesses, and so therefore have maybe no income at all um, or very little. And so then recently we've seen the announcement of over three weeks ago from the two ministers talking about, sorry, is everything okay then? Yes, go ahead Patricia. Uh, three weeks ago of announcement of, of su a support package which we still haven't seen put in place. Um, and uh, even on Friday a letter sent out, sending out more information when we didn't know this letter was going out and are inundated with calls to find out how people could apply for this money and again no process in place because the application form still hasn't been uh, developed or, or devised. And so it, it gains a lot of mistrust within the sector and also it's a reputational risk for us as an organisation where we don't have the answers that many of our childminders ask us. And it's something that was supposed to be a thank you for them putting their head above the parapet and putting their families and themselves at risk 
to support those frontline workers, it seems to me the goodness has been taken out of it. So they do feel as if space that they have been left abandoned, consider childminders were the only route for many years for people to go. I think also that um, the education authorities last week announcement where originally they were paying the childminders the fees uh, to the end of the, um, the college or school year has now been stopped and they're only going to get paid to the end of April. Um, we've been in touch with the Department of Education and we've asked um, if they would look into this because we think at this stage it's unfair because at the same time they're saying that if you're entitled to claim your retainer fee for the summer, then you, there's a possibility you can do that. So on one hand, they're stopping the payment at the end of the year, and on the other hand, they might be going to get the retainer fee for the summer. So again, it's the mixed messages uh, that make it very difficult, particularly for childminders. Um, so again, added on top of that is the communication marketing um, or office that is talking about if you've taken a retainer fee, you could be acting in illegally. And so there's a fear among childminders that they're going to have to pay the few families that paid a retainer fee to help them through this difficult time, that they may have to pay that back. So to really finish, my worry is that the childcare sector could be decimated by all of this. Um, and that we might find that a lot of people will leave the sector and a lot of parents will find it difficult now to find childcare. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Can I bring uh, Pauline back in? Okay, Chair, apologies for that technical hitch. Um, no, I, I was <laughs> saying that my comments are on behalf of, of, our, of both the uh, early childhood sector and the school age sector on behalf of early years and play board. Uh, I suppose just acknowledging the current situation and um, both types of settings are facing enormous financial pressure due to falling numbers. Um, in the papers presented, we know that 86% of school age child cares are closed and over 90% of day cares are closed. Those that are open um, have an average attendance of five per day, um, with the daycare being down to 2.2% of their capacity. I, I would like to inform and make members aware that no setting made the decision to close lightly. All settings, and I talked to many, many providers, there were high levels of distress and regret that they had to make that decision to close, um, mainly in the final week of March and the first week of April, some closed earlier. The small number of settings that do remain open are providing services for the children of key workers as defined by the Department of Health, but increasingly settings on the ground are getting requests to provide services for key workers from the Department of Education's list. So it is my hope that there will be some clarity on that in, in the coming days. Settings have benefited from the furlough scheme in terms of the vast majority of them have been able to furlough staff. But I think, again, I really need to make members aware that this does not address the sustainability and the viability of services. Um, those services have really significantly decrease the capacity to remain viable. Um, while settings don't want to increase fees to parents, it may be the only option if fixed costs are not addressed. Um, that, that is our hope that the sustainability package will support settings to address that. There is an urgent need to address the stabilisation and the survival of what is a very essential early care and education of the school age sector. And I suppose while the crisis has revealed how much our region relies on early childhood and school age care in order for other workforces to function, I was greatly comforted, Sarah, by your opening remark because action, action to date does not signal sufficient recognition of the importance of the sector either now or into the future. So while for all providers this is hurtful, um, for some it will be catastrophic. They may never be in a position to reopen their business. 
and the impact on parents and children who will need more than ever the reassurance of, reassurance of child care that is provided by familiar and qualified ski workers to a high standard and at an affordable rate. But that will bring yet more uncertainty at a time when uncertainty is probably the most damaging thing to the economy and to the mental health of our society here in Northern Ireland. Um, I am hopeful that the proposed sustainability package, the package um, for strategic centres and, and um, the package for assisted home childcare, I'm hopeful that some of the final difficulties um, with uh, and my colleague Philip will, will draw out in more detail. I'm hopeful that those difficulties can be resolved and that we can move very, very quickly to getting money out on the ground for these settings. Um, we've been aware of this situation and we've been working since the 17th of March. It's now seven weeks on from that, and I think the settings urgently need to see a financial commitment on the ground. Um, Chair, we have provided um, a detailed paper that outlines in detail all of those issues. Um, aside from the finance, I think the other thing is um, very clear epi epidemiological um, information available from the Department of Health in line with the needs of young children and child development in terms of running and managing services during this pandemic period is, is the other thing that we would like to see. Is that yes, okay? Th yes, thank you very much in, in, indeed, Pauline. Um, okay, can I bring Philip in from Northern Ireland Daycare Owners? Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank members for the information to brief today. Uh, we understand this issue spans beyond the remit of the Education and Health Committees. Um, to their absolute credit, I know committee members here are far from cold on the issue. On the other hand, my forte does not lie in committee with peer interest, so I trust we can pick up issues in the Q&A where I have not been clear. The reason we are here today is because all is not well. We are facing decimation of the childcare sector. We know it is unprecedented, and we know many politicians and public servants are doing their very best at this time. Firstly, I will tell you what the childcare sector needs in practical terms right away. We need an urgent weekly video meeting with childcare sector representatives, education and health officials, including the BSO. We need this every single week for at least the next 12 weeks. We need a recurring weekly email to all providers using the Family Support NI website that contains links to all updated information. The online information should contain dates, contain pages and page numbers. This information should be shared with individual social workers at the same time so that everyone is aware and everyone is clear. Thirdly, we need a briefing session of this nature with the Health Committee and both respective committees to keep childcare on their agendas for the foreseeable future. These practical measures will allow us to proactively work through the issues that, that the committee cannot be expected to solve. We will continue to approach things with a reason and proportion. We do not seek unrealistic grand gestures. We seek survival. Next, I will try to paint the picture. The fact that there is support is very welcome. Ministerial statements indicate the importance of childcare provision for key workers now and the wider population as we move forward. But while elements of the sport look good, the rollout is too slow. This is a huge domino effect across providers, staff, parents or guardians, and of course, most importantly, children. In March, the Secretary made it very clear to officials that urgent stabilisation was required. If stabilisation of the sector could be addressed, all providers and their staff could then put their full weight in supporting the relief effort. We and others have engaged many times and disclosed everything about providers, their costs, and advised in far more detail than any other sector. I'm talking hundreds of emails and calls, but without terms of engagement other than trying to help and be helped. On March the 18th, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak announced significant financial support for childcare providers across England and noted that the Barnet formula would apply. On the 21st, of March, the Health Minister released a statement and a letter 
which was not sent to providers using the details held on Family Support NI. It noted that new guidelines and support would follow. On April the 9th, the Education Minister announced support measures with further detail, but not enough for providers to know where they stood. Some providers were able to apply for the Small Business Grant Fund, but we understand within the region of 80 to 90 settings were not eligible, and for those who did apply, members will know that grants have not been paid or have faced delay. On April the 21st, we wrote to the Health Minister willing his department to communicate with providers outlining the problems and a clear practical solution. On the 1st of May, we saw the latest guidance issued and this clarified three new things. The percentage of support available to settings that could not open, that there would be an application process managed by the BSO, that there were still many unanswered questions. Today, on the 6th of May, the COVID-19 childcare support scheme is not yet open for applications. It looks like even if the scheme was to open now, that the process could be long drawn out and not cover some of the basic costs. However, in the spirit of reason and objectivity, we, will, we wish to analyse the process once, once it is opened. We plan to write to this committee with an assessment thereafter. Aside from the communication and support package, other key questions include the huge workforce issues, how do we look after our staff without access to PPE testing, and how do we manage coming off furlough? Uh, when the support scheme still isn't up and running. Why is there such a vast difference in key worker lists between education and health? Child care workers are actually on the education uh, key workers list. Parents have been in communication and the disparity between the key workers list has been causing problems. Why is there a minimum 25% quota of children required in a setting before it is allowed to reopen? Why do child care providers seem to be falling through the cracks between education and health? To finish for now, as I outlined at the beginning, it is so important that effective structures of engagement and communication are put in place right away. If this level of departmental commitment requires ministerial direction, then that is exactly what we need. From there, to re the range of issues can be properly discussed and managed as we move further through this, together and in collaboration. Finally, I cannot, give any, cannot be any clearer when I say that if these measures are not put in place, if this issue is not given the due care and attention immediately, then the risk of mass redundancy and closures of providers across all constituencies will rise exponentially every day and every week onwards. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Phil. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, I might try to summarise some of the key points just uh, to make sure everyone has heard them clearly, but our childcare providers today um, you can correct me if I'm wrong with, with any uh, summary that I make here, but the, the, the poorly communicated and delayed delivery of the child care support package from the Department of Health and Department of Education has left our child care providers feeling discriminated uh, under enormous financial pressure. Uh, with a decreased capacity to <laughs> remain viable and facing the decimation of the childcare sector. That's how serious and urgent this situation is. Um, indeed, I understand from Playboard NI surveys that potentially uh, up to 20% of childcare providers may not be able or feel they may not be able to reopen further to the COVID-19 shutdown. So I am grateful for how clear you have been today with regards to the urgency and the seriousness of the situation and indeed for the, the key issues that you've raised that, that we will be able to raise with the departmental officials on your behalf. At, at that point, can I bring in uh, members for any questions or clarification that they may uh, wish to request and start with the Deputy Chairperson, Karen Mullen. Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, just to say that I found the line for the three uh, contributors really, really bad poor. It, 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 was, um, it was difficult, yeah. Apologies. And I, and I didn't pick up on it all. Um, I apologise. I found it really, really difficult. I don't know if our members did, but I'll just try my best here. Um, Philip, Pauline and Patricia, uh, thank you. I'd like to thank you today for attending the committee and like the chair, I would like to thank everyone in the sector 
and commend yourselves for the work that you have done in relation to representing the sector and will continue to do. We very much value the work of our child care sector um, and it's very, very important to us as members of the Education Committee. Uh, we've heard from you all in relation to the challenges of our child care sector are currently facing and the likely impact for the future. So it is vital for us to take these issues forward and seek to resolve and support you. Um, I've also found the lack of clarity and the poor communication uh, difficult as we move through the this pandemic that we're currently in. Uh, and then it was made even more difficult when the, pro when the administration and the process has moved to help. Um, so I thank you for providing the briefing for us. And, uh, the measures that Philip has, has outlined there, is, I'm not sure if you could provide it then, but if they could be listed and sent in. And if I'm hearing correctly, it's you quickly need to know around the process for applying for financial support. There needs to be clear guidance given. Um, and since the letter has come out on Friday, has there been any further contact or updates with yourselves? That was no. yes. No, no. Um, I, th I think um, I think that you're quite right. I think. Certainly, the ministers set aside the budget, um, and there are three schemes. Um, and as Philip said, you know there, ha there has been some work in the background, but there has been no clarity since Friday's letter, and I think you know that has led to a lot of confusion on the ground. Um, but we're hopeful that that clarity will emerge over the next day or two. Yes, yeah, we would hope so as well, because we go on to another week and we lose another week. Um, so thank you so much for that. Chair, that's can me. I, thank yes. you. Thank you, Karen. Sorry, can I just come in and say that, yes, I have been in touch with the Department of Health around the application. And the problem was that when we seen the application last week, we were asked for child minors to go through a horrendous bureaucratic process unlike how some of the others as we give the analogy that on, on Monday about if you were a small business applying for the ten thousand pound grant, uh, it was a much smoother process. So we were due to meet the department today and have a conversation about how this would be rolled out. That is now being deferred to next week because the application still hasn't been completed. Okay. Right, thank you very much for that. Okay, thanks. Can I bring in uh, Robin Newton? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, again, welcome Patricia, Pauline, uh, and Philip to this now formal meeting. I think, I think, Chair, in terms of, I think there is a general recognition of the value of the sector, probably not as formally recognised as, as maybe it, it could be, but there's no doubt that it is going to be a key sector as we return to normal um, after this pandemic is over and the decisions are made and the phased return. The importance of the sector in underpinning the economy I don't think can be overestimated. Underpinning education uh, and indeed their facilities for key workers in the future. So I, I agree with a lot of what the delegation have said, Chair, and I'm not going to reiterate it from, from Monday, but obviously communication seems to be the big issue around it and the need for clarity. I have received a very detailed uh, email from a constituent who runs uh, 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 child care facilities. I won't go through all of it, but suffice to say that she is outlining most of what Patricia, Pauline and Philip ha have said today. I'll read, if you don't mind, Chair, just the, the very last uh, few lines of her, of, her, of her email to me. And she says, most schools are closed, teachers are at home in the main, childminders are needed for the childcare. If these things are not done, and she's referring to the matters that Pauline Patricia and Philip have raised. If these things are not done, many child minors will have to resign their registrations. They just cannot afford to continue. 
They have opened their homes to assist parents during this pandemic, pandemic and getting no, and she underlines the word no, recognition for it whatsoever. There's a lot of anger. And I think those last five words, there's a lot of anger, really just summarise for me because I know that she is well connected to other childminders who do similar work. And this girl specialises in, in, in work for uh, difficult children. So I think, Chair, in, in terms of our support as a committee uh, for the sector, um, I think we're taking the right approach uh, here, and I think we do need to reiterate the need for clarity uh, and support for the sector overall. Okay. I have no particular questions uh, based on what we agreed no, on no. Uh, Monday, Chair. No problem, Robin. Thank you. And, and members, don't feel the need to have to ask uh, questions. We will, as I've stated earlier, have Department of Health and Department of Education officials um, to whom we can uh, put uh, questions on behalf of the organisation shortly. Um, can I ask uh, William Humphrey? Um, Chair, thank, thanks very much to the, the delegation for coming in to us this morning. Um, Robin is our education lead on this committee. I just want to uh, reiterate what he has said in terms of the uh, the work that uh, the folk do and the people they are representing do so vital um, to, to our community and to wider society going forward. Uh, I don't have questions because I, I list, just listen to what has been said uh, and obviously the committee will take these things forward and, and push for answers. The communication does seem to be uh, a, a problem and, and obviously the failure to communicate effectively leads to further problems and uh, growing frustration, so we need to address that very quickly, but um, I have no questions. Thanks. Thank you, thanks, William. Uh, Daniel McCrossan. Yeah, thanks, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, just to add that this line is terrible, and I've been missing half the conversation that catch in the rest, so uh, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Look, Daniel, we're, we're doing our best to persevere, all of us, under these uh, difficult uh, technological circumstances, so we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. I think people are just about picking up the key points that are being raised, so go ahead there. Yeah, uh, uh, there's no question per se, it's just again to raise just my frustration in relation to the poor communication. Uh, and, and clearly there is an issue uh, uh, at executive level across departments in that we are in a crisis, a crisis that none of us have ever seen in our lifetime and hope to never see again when we get out of this. And the pace at which the executive is responding, or each individual department, is entirely unacceptable. And it's going to have great consequences going forward unless they're more swift in the response and reacting to this to help and assist people, particularly within this sector as well. And that, 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 it seems to be a trend. I don't know if it's a lack of agreement between parties around the table or what, but there's a big issue here that needs to be dealt with. And ultimately, it's having a very grave effect on the ground, clearly within this sector as well. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Uh, Robbie Butler. Robbie? You mute. Robbie, are you on mute? I would never be on mute. Okay. I, I, I wouldn't even be on mute. Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, no. Keep going. Can, can you hear us okay, Robbie? Sorry, I can hear myself. I thought there was somebody else talking. No, you're, you go ahead there. Okay, thank you. Thanks to the guys and thanks for their input today. Um, I know we covered a lot of the ground covered on Monday. Um, and I will, what, what sort of shook me was the reiteration of how the sector feels want the value. Um, and I don't think that that is just pointed at what's happening with the COVID crisis. I think that is um, a symptom of something that has been there for a while. I just want them to know that in terms of the committee, we do value the sector highly, especially when we look at the impact of the first thousand days of child's life and, and, and what uh, a high-quality childcare sector can do and the difference it can make. I know Patricia had said about the 2,700 childminders and the amount of children they look after, but I was just wondering, um, does that give us some estimate of the scale of the need there? I was just thinking in terms of, was there anything that I might be missing in the pack? or something that we can use in terms of measurement of the scale of the full child care sector, including the, um, the daycare facilities, the number of employees, number of businesses, and the number of children that are looked after in, to in total. 
to give us a, a sense of scale. We've got the sense of urgency, uh, yeah. but uh, better, a better picture of the sense of scale. I think that would be really, really useful because um, I think we're, we're certainly joint uh, in terms of the committee, in terms of our, 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 our uh, sense of importance for dealing with this. But could you, could you do something on that first, Pauline? Um, okay. Yeah, I can respond to that, Robbie, and it's also in the paper I present, uh, presented, but um, there are over 28,000 childcare places provided by Jay Nurseries and out of schools, um, and of, of the 334 registered Day Nurseries, almost 80% of those are private businesses, and that's an important point. Um, and we would, we would suggest that that would account for at least 7,000 staff working across the, the, the daycare settings. And we have provided a breakdown of that within the table as well, or within the paper. Okay, can I, so can it's, I just it's, it's highly significant both as an employer and as an enabler for others to take up employment. Robbie, I'm just going to re just repeat that really quickly just to check that it was clear. So 28,000 childcare places across day nurseries and school uh, settings, um, 344 registered day nurseries, about approximately 80% of which are private businesses and approximately 7,000 employees. Okay, Robbie? Yeah. yeah. So thank you for, thank you for that, Chair. Thank you for that, Pauline. Okay, uh, Catherine Kelly. Thank you, Chair, and um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for meeting with us again today. Meeting with you is always absolutely invaluable, um, and especially at this time. There is no doubt that your sector is a breaking point, and childcare is too important to our society for it to be left in this way. Um, in your view, how do you see the future of the sector oh, on the other side of COVID-19? Sorry, Catherine, one sec. Can I, can I just ask everyone who isn't speaking if they can mute their phone call to make sure we give our contributors as best chance as possible to be heard and bring you back in there, Catherine? Thank you. In your view, how do you see the future of the sector on the other side of COVID-19? Pauline, Patricia, can Philip, I, you want to come in can on I, that? Can I just say that, that I am worried about why our numbers may have dropped, as I said, and decimated, but also this will have to be handled, I think, collectively, um, as some have mentioned, and maybe coming from the executive, because part of the problem will be as we come out of this crisis uh, with regard to continuing around infection and control, so a childminder that may have had um, a number of children on their books um, and families may have to reduce that number. And which family or which children do they pick? And that's the dilemma that some of these childminders will find themselves in. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a childminder and you've been minded three families and those families have been kind enough during this crisis, while well, you have been working to pay you a retainer fee or a small sum of money to help you continue because while they've been at home as a parent, they've been receiving their salary, then uh, they may not be able to take all three families and will they have to pay one of those retainer fees back. So there's a lot of complications here that need to be thought out and thought out properly. And that's why I would support the um, suggestion that Philip made around the sector collectively getting together and uh, with the departments and making sure that we have a clear and focused plan on how we move forward um, in the next coming weeks. Yeah. Thank you. I, 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 I would like to say, um, and I would like to back up Patricia's comments there, I'm, I'm certainly speaking as a, as a provider, we need to safeguard the future of the childcare sector so that it remains available for working parents. Um, we need to rebalance the loss of income providers will experience and avoid a mid-term crisis really from June onwards. Um, I mean, the, the process that has been set up at the, at the moment um, looks like it's going to be very thorough in its nature um, and would be useful support um, moving forward from the six to nine months. But it should have been developed um, between April and June for use from July onwards as we open up again and not from the very beginning. 
Um, it, the, 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 the key problem is the 80% of the funding is, is, is being forced to stay closed. It's basically, sorry. 80% of funding for being closed or forced to stay closed, including 25% minimum, is unfair on those providers that have to go through no fault of their own, don't have enough parents who fall under the current Department of Health guidelines. If we're only allowed 25%, we're obviously we're not going to be able to stay open because it's just not viable without continued government support. We feel that moving forward, that things are not going to go back to normal for providers. We're going to be, have significantly reduced numbers across the board because we're not going to be allowed to take other children in. Yeah. I think, Catherine, just to comment, I would all be, I agree with everything that Philip has, has said there. I think the impact on the, on, on the sector will depend upon the wider process and what the new normal looks like. But I, I, it is highly likely to lead to reduced capacity and therefore reduced income to meet costs. And that's why it's absolutely vital that the sector is stabilised at this point and urgently stabilised. And then, as both Philip and Patricia have said, that we work together within the sector and with officials to come up with a plan that will see us through the next period of this pandemic. I think that is absolutely critical. I think that coupled with um, being able to reassure both parents and those who work in the sector that, that childcare can be safely provided within the pandemic and build confidence, I think that's also important as well as absolutely the financial support that will be needed to go forward. Because I think what, again, I would want members to really understand is that if it's vital, parents will have no choice. They will need to use childcare. But if the childcare is closed, they will be virtually impossible to rebuild and reopen because we require qualified staff to meet the minimum standards. And if those staff go and access work elsewhere in the economy, um, it will be virtually impossible to reopen and rebuild the sector from the point that it's at. We've all worked over the last 40 years um, to build this sector and to get it to the point that it is. There has been significant private investment by the private operators within the sector in building the sector, and I think it's vital that that is secured and stabilised going forward. Yeah, thank, thank you, Colin. And I agree, and I believe the departments need to be planning now for how we can protect the sector on the other side of this. Um, and that saying comes to mind, failure to plan is planning to fail. Um, and I'd just like to thank, thank you all for, for meeting with us again today. Um, it's, it is, as I've already said, invaluable. Um, and it's, it's good to get an update from you all at this stage. Thank you, Catherine. Morris, Bradley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Apologies, Chair. I, I, I couldn't make out an awful lot of what was been said there, but uh, I would be currently Different cases across sectors, including the childcare sector, people who are unable to avail of any other assistance uh, because of a partner earning more than 15000 per annum, which prevents universal credit access and uh, employment support allowance. Uh, and considering that of the 344 uh, data centres, or probably one person employed, it's a large, large. Uh, sectors we have dropped through the net. I don't know where you heard of me or not. Uh, uh, it was hard to make you up out, Morris. Um, if you want to yeah. try again a bit more uh, loud and clear, um, we can see if we can pick up a key point from you. Yeah, it's, uh, well, I'll, I'll be uh, to think. It's just the, the key points are that uh, of the 344 day uh, care centers, 80% are probably uh, a single operator. They have no opportunity to deal with any other assistance, uh, especially if they have a partner earning more than 16000 per annum. That prevents access to universal credit. 
for Employment Support Alliance. Uh, they've slipped through the net, and that is really unacceptable. Yeah, I think that's an important point, Morris. Um, the, the the lack of alternative or other financial support that has been available to child care providers and, and child care workers. Um, and it, it pushes back on what seems to be some degree of perception or concern that there is a risk of, of double funding child care providers or, or, or child care workers, which I can only explain the extensive application process for this child care support that has been put in place compared to other financial support schemes for other sectors. Is that is that fair to say from our, our child care organisations? Philip, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, yes, indeed it is. It, it, the, the, the whole process, as I said, seems to be very drawn out. Now, once we actually see what the detail of it, we will obviously consider it and get back to the committee. Okay. Thanks, Morris. Uh, Justin McNulty. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Justin. Um, thanks, Polly, Tricia, Philip, for your information. It's just very apparent how passionate you are all about child care and how eager you are for a sustainable package to deliver and for the solution to be delivered by the executive, which should be forthcoming. Um, you mentioned the, um, your, your asks. Can you just circulate them with the, the uh, committee so that we're clear what they specifically are? Um, do, all these little problems with lines, so just get that in clear is difficult. Yeah, um, no, no, so no, no. Just, just to come in, I think that's a really good uh, point, Justin. Um, I'll bring, bring you back in again, but as we draw towards the close of our questions, if we um, could focus in on the, the key issues that you now need us to raise with officials. I think is that, that's what you were asking, Justin, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, and Philip, you mentioned the disparity in the key workers that's is causing problems. Yeah. Just give me some clarity on that, Philip. Pardon? Sorry. The key Can workers list, the disparity on the key workers list is causing problems and confusion. Can you just clarify to me what that actually means? Okay. Yes, certainly. So there, there, there obviously are two key workers lists in, in use at present. We have the Department of Health key workers list and the Department of Education key workers list. Now, at present, we are only allowed to open up our child care for uh, people who fall under the current Department of Health list. Now, this list is quite restrictive. Um, there are sort of three, three sets in it. It's much wider um, in the Department of Education, where actually you look at um, child care workers actually fall into the key workers list. Um, we're getting parents who are coming to... This is me talking as a provider. We're getting parents coming to talk asking us if we can take their children in. Unfortunately, they don't fall under the list for the Department of Health, so we cannot take them. Are you telling me there's different key workers just for the Department of Health than there is for the Department of Education? Yeah. Yes, I am. Is that yes, the there's, there's, there's two lists. There's the Department of Health and then there's a wider list for the Department of Education. So if I can explain to you, um, Child minders were already minded key workers off those lists, and there has been a um, a bit of flexibility with regard to the Department of Health on this uh, as they went forward, and each it was done on a case by case basis. So the majority of children being minded by child minders would be off the DOH list, which which really is the emergency services. So it's, it's all of those people who who would be working on, on front lines. But the reality is we have a child minder who comes up there, um, I mind it, um, that children, and uh, they're not seen as a key worker on the DOH list, or um, I have a parent that works in ASDA, and I have the, the, uh, the husband who's a lorry driver delivering essential goods, but they're not on the DOH list. So there has been some very little flexibility with regard to some child minders who have already been minding these children pre-COVID-19 to continue, but it, it causes a big angst and it causes a lot of confusion at the very beginning because there was two lists. I can understand that. I'm very confused myself. I think... So I can imagine the, the concern that gets amongst you guys and some parents. Yeah, and a lot of those people on the 
wider list would have got letters from their employers to say that they were key workers, and that put childminders and I'm sure the childcare sector in very difficult positions because they were being told it was a DOH list only. Incredible, incredible. Um, Philip, you also mentioned a few very questions. Sorry, Chris, can I maybe come in there for a minute? Um, yeah, fine, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I think, I think we are moving towards the situation where we do need to look at, at a common list. However, I would point out in the very early days of this pandemic, there was a recognition that the space available within childcare settings is considerably smaller than the space available within education settings. Um, and there was concern that there may be demand that would exceed what could be supplied given the requirement for social distancing and space. I think in reality that demand has not manifested itself. Um, in many cases, um, health care workers were amongst the first to remove their children from child care settings. Um, but I think as we, as we move towards the next phase and more people are seeking child care and actively seeking child care, I think it would be important to look at, look at those lists again. But uh, well, hopefully I think that, that will happen. I, 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 can I also point out that the way the key workers list is at present, we currently have to have a 25% minimum of your registered numbers. So basically a nursery is, say, 100 places in size. They must have a minimum of 25 children wishing to take up a place so that they can avail of the full government funding for this. A lot of nurseries don't have that many children who are, whose parents fall under that key work list. As such, they're being penalised and only allowed to claim back 80% of their costs. Okay. That sounds incredible, Philip. That was, that was my expression, what do you carry on what you just have? Um, all the parents out there, who some of them who are continue to pay their, for their child minor support because they feel an emotional attachment to their child minor sons. Uh, they have a fear of losing the kid's faith with that child minor. Um, and also, you, uh, you've, you've already touched on the fact that going back, you need, what is the new normal and how is that going to impact both your um, sustainability financially, but how does it impact the kids emotionally in terms of going into that new environment, which is maybe transformed to what they, the, the one they left? Is that something that you give much consideration to? I think that that was something that I opened with at the very beginning, that probably every very many have lost sight of is the damage and the irreplaceable um, opportunities for, for the children in all of this because there has been um, obviously relationships broken down between the child care and child minder sector um, because parents are grieved that their children couldn't be taken and minded and so therefore the children at the very bottom of all of this and the purpose of why we give uh, child care in the first place has been kind of lost, and I do think there won't be a lot of children affected by this. Yeah, sad and frightening. So thank you very much for your answers. I'm Trish, Polly, and Philip, thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, thank you. I, I think that's every member uh, who is in attendance uh, able to ask a question <laughs> um, and invaluable. Uh, engagement with our, our child care sector and representative organisations. Um, ch child care representatives, would you like to make any final comments before we bring our session to a close? Um, I, I would just like to thank you for the opportunity this morning and obviously I'm not getting close session to put our cases forward. Um, and I would just say that like to the members to, I suppose, follow on to something that Robert Newton and some of the rest of you said that if, if in any of the communication that you have with the media, otherwise, we would just mention the child care sector and give them some recognition because at the minute, particularly the child care sector or child finders, feel that they have, have no recognition. Often people think that they're just glorified babysitters and they're so in it for the pin money when actually they're professional child care providers. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, would, I would like to say just thank you all for uh, taking time to listen to us and, uh, and, and thank you for continuing to push this, uh, push this process forward. 
And um, Chris, again, I, I would join with my two colleagues thanking the committee for the recognition that they have brought to the issue. Um, I do think that many of, of, of the problems that we've discussed this morning, I think there are solutions to those, and I think there's a great deal of goodwill to ensure that that happens. But uh, I think the child care sector is, is, is a place that um, is going to be critical as we move through this phase of the pandemic. It's something that economically is really, really necessary. But it is also really necessary, as Patricia said, in terms of the nurturing framework, which is something that we've committed to in policy terms and in terms of the mental health and well-being of, of the sectors we move forward, as well as being a significant employer in its own right. So I do think that this is a continuing conversation, and I look forward to having that. Thank you again for your time. Thank you very much indeed. Folks, I, I, I trust that the engagement the Education Committee has had with you this week um, is evidence of the, the value with which we regard our child care sector. And I, I reiterate the thanks of this Education Committee to child care workers across Northern Ireland who are playing a, a key role in the COVID-19 response and who are absolutely vital to the development of our, our children and young people um, and to our economy in Northern Ireland. I agree that there are solutions to these challenges. Uh, you've put forward many today, and we hope that we will have a constructive engagement with our Department of Health and Department of Education officials in trying to move urgently to those solutions being put in place for you. Uh, and also, as you say, to ongoing engagement with you. So thank you very much indeed for your time today, folks, and we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you. OK, members, uh, bring the, the uh, clerk in <coughs> uh, to summarise any actions and um, keep us moving forward. Peter? Chair, just before, just before you bring the clerk in. Yep. Daniel? This, I, I don't want to be repeating this, but this is the worst line that we have had, and it's, it's very hard to hear any detail, and I'm just conscious before the department comes in, um, the, the public are listening to this as well, it's just, this is just not good today. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Can we restart the call? I, the whole thing? I, I agree with you, Daniel. Um, I, we're, we're working as best we can on it. I'm doing my best to summarise. Um, the key points of questions being raised and the key points of evidence being given to try and ensure that, that they are not missed. Um, there will be a bit more detail in our engagement with officials, but I'm not sure that we have an alternative available to us at this stage. Um, your point has been raised, If uh, the, the clerk is here, if we have a way to improve this line during the committee, we will do so. But in lieu of being able to do that and given the importance <laughs> of the matters at hand, I will do my best to summarise. And if anyone misses something that they really think that they do need to hear, please do interject. Clark? Also, Chairperson, I'd suggest to members that they keep on Microsoft Teams and they uh, message me uh, during proceedings. And uh, if something's missed, we can uh, bring it to the, to the Chair's attention. Uh, apologies for the really, really bad line. Um, there is another system which I think the Commission has signed off on uh, called Starleaf, which uh, I was hoping that we would um, be trialling next week. Well, we'll see. Hopefully we will. And that will be like a, a video system, which I believe the department will be able to use as well because they can just phone in. But hopefully that will be a lot better. But uh, thanks to members for their perseverance. And uh, <coughs> those that have been texting me, um, the only suggestions I can give is to dial in again switch from mobile to landline, um, but it's, uh, I know a number of you have done that, it's not working. So, so, yeah, just, to, just to reiterate what the, the clerk has said there, members, the, the Assembly Commission have been working on a, a video conferencing based system that should significantly improve our communications during committee meetings, and we hope that that may be available uh, very soon, if not next week. Um, so uh, apologies, I, I realise this is difficult, Daniel, if, if there are
key points that you feel that you have missed and you wish to interject, please do so. I'm doing my absolute best to try and uh, keep order and to summarise those key points as we proceed. Okay. So uh, thank you, Chair. And I, 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 I know that uh, everyone's trying their best. I, I just can't help but think that there's some setting up there that because you're, you're coming across here, people are phoning in that's all having the issue. And 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 point noted, and that's why I will try to use the clearness with which you are hearing me to our advantage by summarising key points that are being raised. Okay. Okay, can I bring the clerk in then? <laughs> Chairperson, just in terms of actions from that, the briefing we've just had, uh, the committee had already written to both ministers uh, on this subject. Uh, is it the case that um, the committee wants to share that with the childcare sector and indeed with the Committee for the Economy because there are, I would guess, uh, economic um, ramifications around uh, the availability of childcare? So you're content to do that? Yeah, me members content to share the correspondence that we had sent to the Education Minister and Health Minister with the, the childcare organisations, the Economy Committee, and if we haven't already done so, the Health Committee. We've done so. Yeah, we have done so. Yeah. Members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, thank you. So, Chairperson, I'd ask the department just to phone in a little bit earlier than planned at 10.30. So, in the in the gap, uh, if the committee's content, Chairperson, maybe to move on and just we'll deal with correspondence and maybe talk about the forward work programme yep. and maybe stop if the department then phones in a little early. Okay, members. So, while we're um, waiting the uh, departmental officials, can I uh, take us to agenda item 7, correspondence, and ask the clerk to speak <coughs> to our correspondence. So, Chairperson, um, we're at uh, page 84 of your pack, and there there is a summary note. So, if I can ask, Chairperson, if members are just content to um, follow the suggested approach in the index note with the following ex exceptions, if that's if members are content to do that. Agreed. 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 Okay. So, there's, there's an item of correspondence on page 86 from the Northern Ireland Forest School Association. Um, it's just that they've, they've subsequently written to us again, so just asking if members will defer consideration of that. We can give it a, a proper talking about um, next week. Members are happy enough about that. Agreed. Agreed. And then, other item is at uh, 7.5, it's page 140. Uh, this is correspondence from the Education Authority providing the Education Authority's statutory operations audit of practice. So this was the SEND statement thing um, audit. This is the final report and there's the action plan associated with it. Uh, the report does provide some additional information um, around the number of referrals received, the statements issued, how this varied across the five offices in Northern Ireland and also how it varies across the year, which is actually quite interesting. There's also an indication that during the period of the audit, 85% of statements were outside of the statutory time limit, um, which again is the information I didn't have. This is not COVID-19 related. Um, so, uh, and in line with guidance, the, the committee had previously agreed to undertake an informal session on this with Nikki on the 1st of June and with the Education Authority on the 8th of June, again in formal sessions, just chairperson to ask members, are they content with that approach? Um, do they want to um, maybe think about that again after we've uh, tried out um, Starleaf, which is our new um, video call system? Yeah, members, obviously the, the Education Authority audit of SEM operations is, is not strictly COVID-19 related. However, it is a priority issue for the committee, um, and I imagine most members would agree uh, an issue of urgency and importance. Um, are, are members content to have a think about whether we actually do need to hear from the Education Authority in formal session on that report? And as the clerk has suggested, see how the new video conferencing system works um, before um, perhaps agreeing to hear that evidence in, in formal session. Members? Agreed. Agreed. Can, I, Chair, can, can I just uh, raise, raise an issue? I think the, the report looks to me to be a very comprehensive report. The aspect I think that is missing and would be crucial, I think, uh, for the deliberations of, of the committee is really, um, it doesn't indicate what their plan for implementation of the recommendations are. 
nor does it indicate who has responsibility and ownership of the plan, gives no idea of timelines or indeed any measurements of success that uh, they would put in place. So in, in deliberating about the report, I think it's a very sane, very sensible, very, very de detailed, um, but it's missing in those four or five areas that I've just mentioned here. Yeah, and, and actually, the, the more I think about it, Robin, as well, the, there is a, a COVID-19 relatedness to this matter, given that the, the Coronavirus Act notices reduced the duty on the Department of Education um, to a, a best endeavour, and which seems to have um, put some degree of pause on the statementing process in the Education Authority as well. So the, the, the implementation of improvements to the statementing process and the current status of the statementing process further to the impact of COVID-19 are serious and urgent issues. So I, I would ask that the members give consideration to whether we actually do need a formal hearing with the Education Authority on this matter. Um, and, and to see whether our video conferencing gives us the capability to do that. Members content? Yeah, okay. Chairman, I would, I would like to hear what the department, or like to see on paper what the, if they cover the five or whatever points I raised there, Chair. So, Chairperson, the committee agreed then that the clerk would write to the Education Authority asking that when they do come along in whatever form that they answer the questions that uh, Mr Newton has uh, set out. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, jolly good. Um, okay. Um, members, if there are no other questions then about our uh, uh, correspondence, if members are content to move on. Agreed. Great. Okay. Members, agenda item eight is our forward work program. Can I refer members to the draft forward work program uh, on page 219 and remind members that it has been agreed that the AQE PPTC brief um, will be formal um, rather than informal as shown in the Ford Work Programme and that formal briefing will be on the 13th of May 2020. Uh, the meeting will start at 9.15 um, and the session with the, the department will be reduced in time to ensure we keep within timelines. Can I ask members if they wish to revise the running order for the 20th of May so that the Northern Ireland Teaching Council can attend a formal session to talk about COVID-19 related matters and the pay settlement uh, with the department giving its uh, COVID-19 update afterwards and then uh, an informal meeting on the 18th of May will not be required. Members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. So, Great. Chair, further to that, um, we'd, uh, as you can see, planned to have a uh, joint briefing from Department of Education, Department of Health on childcare. We're actually getting that today, so uh, I guess we can take that off the forward work programme for now, and members can, uh, uh, once they've heard from the department, uh, decide what further briefing they might need, if that is uh, acceptable. Members? Chair? Agreed. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, did somebody join us there? Yeah. Uh, can I just check? Did someone join the tally conference? Yes, Tina Densford. So who's that? Sorry. Uh, Tina. Tina. Tina Dempster. Thanks, Tina. Um, so Paul Mem Brush here. Uh, Tina Dempster. Paul Brush. Yep. If. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Uh, if, maybe if members take their ease until um, the other uh, DEDOH members join us. Okay, okay, members, we're just going to pause very briefly until all officials are with us. Okay. This is the okay. Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Okay, members, agenda item six is our Department of Education and Department of Health briefing with regards to the, child, the, the COVID-19 child care support scheme. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 13 of the meeting pack? Uh, Department of Health correspondence regarding the child care measures at page 19 and uh, for our, our future briefing with the Permanent Secretary, I see a response on examination arrangements at page 23. Can I refer members to tabled items, which include uh, the Department of Education COVID-19 situation report and a few other matters there as well that I'll return to when we are with the Permanent Secretary. Okay, can I uh, confirm then and welcome that uh, the following officials and check that you can hear us clearly. We have Eilish McDaniel from the Department of Health. Yes, Chris. Thanks. Paul Brush, Director of Early Years, Children and Youth at the Department of Education. Yes, sir. Tina Dempster, at the Department of Education. Yes, I'm here. Thanks. And Kathy Galway, formerly known as the Department of Education. <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you, officials. Um, I'm not sure if you were able to hear our session with the child care sector representatives, but um, some stark evidence was received. And uh, in summary, the evidence that we took suggested that child care representatives felt that as a result of a poorly communicated and, and delayed delivery of the Department of Health, Department of Education, child care support scheme, and of course the unprecedented circumstances presented by COVID-19 that the sector 
is feeling uh, discriminated in terms of other financial support packages for other sectors under enormous financial pressure um, at, at risk of decimation and decreased capacity uh, to remain open, which would obviously have a serious impact on the development of children and the recovery of our economy. So there is an urgent need of stabilisation and financial support for the sector. They, they raised a, a range of uh, individual issues, um, which included concerns about uh, the application form uh, not being with them, yet the application process being complex, um, concerns around 80% of uh, costs only being covered rather than 100%, concerns with regards to um, administrative staff costs um, that were in organisations not being eligible for cost recovery, uh, differentials between the Department of Education and Department of Health key worker lists that may have been for good reason initially. The 25% minimum of uh, children attending for, organ for uh, providers to be able to avail of funding, uh, trust approval to open, um, and uh, the provision of PPE and testing. Perhaps in your, in your remarks out outlining the nature of the scheme, you could endeavour to respond to some of those concerns, and obviously members will have follow-up questions as well. Is that okay? Ground. Okay, um, feel free to in introduce yourself um, when you're, you're speaking as well. The line this morning is not, is not good. It is beyond uh, my control and our control, and we apologise for that. If you could speak as loudly and clearly as possible, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's Ali Galway here, so I'm going to make some opening remarks, and then Ali should make some uh, further remarks that we hope to pick up on some of the points um, that you've made on behalf of the sector. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to provide an update committee today on the COVID-19 emergency sanitary financial package. Um, I'm Cathy Broadway, previously head of the established her unit. Um, and joining me is Tina Dempster, um, Paul Rush from the Adelis Annual Director of Family and Children's Policy in the Department of Health. Uh, the Ministers for Health and Education issued a joint announcement uh, just less than two weeks ago on the 9th of April about the support measures for the childcare sector. Immediately following the approved allocation of 12 million from the Department of Finance, the package of measures they in since address the following key issues for childcare. Is that easier if I... Yes, that's better. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, the package of measures they announced aims to address the following key issues for childcare provision in response to COVID-19. Uh, that's the need to ensure that registered childcare providers, including childminders, who remain open to care safely for a reduced number of children uh, during limited operating arrangements, can do so without risking the sustainability of their setting or provision. To ensure key workers and parents of vulnerable children do not experience financial hardship as a result of incurring additional or higher costs for bespoke approved home childcare or longer hours of childcare. And to ensure registered childcare daycare providers and childminders who need to operate longer hours or cover holiday or evening provisions are able to do so. And in addition, both ministers agreed that they would seek to address the issue of sectoral sustainability by developing a support measure for settings that have closed to ensure they can reopen now and if not needed now, after the crisis. The funding was 12 million and it was allocated from April to June and that was to enable support to be provided for the following. Uh, the bespoke approved home childcare scheme and that's aiming to support around 100 home child carers to enable key workers to have their child care needs met in their own homes. Enhanced support for around 200 registered child finders who provide child care for key workers and vulnerable children. 
Support for approximately 75 registered daycare settings to remain open. Again, for key workers and vulnerable children in locations where key worker parents need them most. Sustainability measures for providers that have closed. A childcare advice and guidance for parents who are key workers, including a helpline and advice and guidance for registered settings and providers. So a robust monitoring and evaluation scheme will be established to both safeguard and maximise the public value of that £12 million investment. This will be overseen by a working group with membership from the Departments of Health and Education, the Health and Social Care Board and the Business Services Organisation who will be managing the application process for all elements of the package. Eilish will now provide an update on the implementation of those measures. Thank you. And good morning, um, members. So our, our plans in terms of implementation are at an advanced stage. And for an emergency scheme, it is fairly complex in terms of design. And I think Cathy has already reflected that. Complexity of design translates into complexity in implementation, unfortunately. In addition, we're administering public funds, and this requires us to be as assured as possible that we have sufficiently robust controls built into the application and payment systems that we put in place. And as public representatives, it's the minimum that you would expect from us. We issued a note to all providers of childcare who fall within the parameters of the scheme last Friday, that was the 1st of May, advising them how the scheme will work in terms of financial payments and what they could expect to happen next. Letters issued to childminders, to daycare providers, and school-age childcare providers. It's intended that applications will start to issue from tomorrow, that's um, Thursday the 7th of May. Applications will issue from the Business Services Organisation, as Cathy has already referred to, and the Business Services Organisation is an ALB of the Department of Health, which is responsible for the provision of shared services to health and social care bodies across Northern Ireland. BSO administers a number of payment schemes, including the nursing bursary and infected blood schemes. And I want to put on record my thanks to the BSO for its support and the valuable advice it has offered us along the way. The aim is to process applications as quickly as possible, and that will rely on applications being completed accurately and supporting evidence being provided in full. The four components of the scheme will have four separate application forms and a number of organisations, NICMA, the Early Years Organisation, Playboard and Employers for Childcare, have healthfully and thankfully agreed to support providers to complete applications to hopefully reduce error rates and ensure that payments can be processed as quickly as possible. We will have to track expenditure um, to, to ensure, among other things, that we're keeping within budget. We're aware that the reaction to date has been somewhat mixed, and you have reflected, um, Chair, um, some of the criticisms or concerns that people have uh, been expressing, um, and some of that criticism um, we got in response to the issue of the letter um, last um, Friday. We've listened to the concerns of childminders that the condition placed on childminders to qualify for the COVID-19 payment of £125 per child per month, up to a maximum of £500 per child, was overly onerous and we've amended that requirement. Now, any childminder who provides childcare to a key worker or a vulnerable child over the period of the pandemic will be eligible to apply for the payment. And the committee may wish to note that a large number of key worker and vulnerable children are currently being cared for by childminders, and we consider that we need to acknowledge and financially support that. The approved home childcare scheme, which we considered was an effective response in public health terms by keeping children in their own homes, has not seen the level of demand we expected, although that may change in time. We note that the Republic of Ireland will introduce a similar scheme as a means of reintroducing the provision of childcare in that jurisdiction. The success of the AHC scheme in Northern Ireland will to some extent depend on the support of daycare providers, and we sought to incentivise their support by covering the additional costs of the childcare salary and the administration costs incurred by the setting. In terms of provision of daycare and school age settings, we have sought to balance childcare supply to meet demand with sustaining the childcare sector to help ensure that, that it's in a position to reopen after COVID-19. We tried to get that balance right by investing more of the budget available in open rather than closed settings, hence the decision to provide 80% rather than 100% of the costs settings incur while closed. We remain of the, of the view 
that an emergency measure and within um, the, 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 the apologies. That's okay. We remain of the view that an emergency measure and within the resources available. It provides a fair level of support across a wide range of settings, alongside other COVID-19 payments to closed businesses, including through the UK government's COVID-19 job retention scheme. The principal policy aim, and Cathy has already reflected this, is to provide childcare to parents who are working on the front line, mainly within health and social care roles, but also other essential public health roles in the police and prison services and in schools. Alongside the children of key workers, we have sought to provide childcare to vulnerable children as well. And as someone with policy responsibility for family support, child protection and looked after children, I can't emphasise enough the importance of supporting families through the provision of childcare during this crisis period. It's essential that we enable some children to leave home and at the same time ensure that they are safe in public health terms. That brings me to another concern raised by the committee um, today, which has also been reported in the media, and that is the more restricted nature of the definition of key worker. We accepted that it is more restricted, and that was for a valid reason when decisions about the operation of the scheme were initially made. This is not simply about the provision of childcare. It's about childcare being provided safely in ways which minimise the spread of infection. We issued guidance to providers as quickly as possible at the start of the process, to help their understanding of safe care in COVID-19 circumstances. We involved public health experts in the development of that guidance. We restricted the numbers cared for in daycare settings and required childminders to provide care to no more than two families on any given day. It was in the context of a predicted COVID-19 surge that decisions to use a more limited definition of key worker and apply operating restrictions were made. Over the last number of weeks, um, there have been calls for us to bring the definition into line with that use in schools, and there appears to be a growth in demand from parents who want to return to work just within the last week. We're committed to keeping the definition under review. If further relaxation, uh, relaxation of um, COVID-19 laws and rules occurs, and it's considered that there's capacity to care safely with an increase in numbers of children, we will certainly look again at the definition of key worker with a view to extending it subject to further consultation with and advice from public health experts. In terms of decisions about keeping daycare or school-age childcare settings open or enabling them to reopen, we have involved Health and Social Care Trust early <coughs> years teams in decisions. Early years teams are familiar with settings through their registration and inspection work and best placed to make decisions about capacity to provide care safely. Again, there is a balance to be struck between being open and being open in ways which are viable and this will be measured by demand for places. There will be a decision for trust early years teams. Sorry, that will be a decision for trust early years teams. We've suggested collaborative working across settings similar to the clustering process within schools. And while we don't have any details at this time, I'm happy to update committee when we have a clearer sense of how that is working. We gave a commitment that no key worker parent within the current definition would have to incur additional childcare fees not incurred prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're currently trying to finalise that process, which we expect to involve employers covering additional not previously incurred childcare costs as an expense and recovering the costs from, uh, uh, through the Department of Health. Finally, we note the committee's concerns about communication. Um, we've tried to be as effective in communication terms um, by working with a reference group at the start of the process and publicising information on the Family Support NI website. I accept fully that we didn't always get it right, and that was part and due to the context we're all working in and the pace of moving from announcement to implementation. Neither department had schemes in place for any element of the package of emergency measures. And in the context of other um, policy challenges outside of childcare, including pressures within um, children's social care uh, services, We've noted the recommendation that a child care forum is established in the correspondence from the Education Committee um, issued a few days ago. We consider it to be a helpful suggestion, which could, among other things, assist communication. And it's our intention to bring the Committee's recommendation to Ministers for review and decision. Thank you um, for, to members for, for, for taking the time to, to listen to us, and Cathy, Tina, Paul and I are happy to take further questions any members may have. Okay. Thanks very much indeed, officials. You've, you've provided us with some helpful information there.
and members will still have some questions to ask. Can I start by bringing in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen? Thank you, Chair. Again, the line was very bad, so uh, I missed a good bit of it, but I'll, I'll try. Okay. Um, let me see, hold on. Just thank you, uh, Kathy and English, for your update. Um, uh, as you know, we got here from the child care sector um, today and on Monday. And as public representatives, we do expect robust control to be in place. But we're looking at all our jurisdictions and they have been able to move ahead of us and have this in place. And as public representatives, we have to listen um, and represent our constituents. And very much outside of the committee, I am the lobby by the child care sector in my own city who have felt that they've been left uh, behind with went over the communication stuff. And now, seven weeks under it, we're sitting with so no clear guidance without financial support to move forward. So we need to see that we act very quickly now from this point on. Those processes are made less bureaucratic. The sector is supported. Financial support gets out immediately. And if we look at a robust plan to ensure we have sectors coming out of the other end of this and that we are supporting um, both financially and otherwise to make sure that it's secured and still there for the future. So uh, I would thank you for coming and giving your time today and your continued work. And I know you are working very hard. I just think it's difficult that it's putting across two departments and you know the messages aren't coming out um, clear or on time. So maybe after this, we'll see all of that rectified. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. And perhaps I could add to Deputy Chair's uh, comments as well. Officials, I think it is important that we thank you for coming here today to communicate openly and clearly with us on these issues and, and for me to note the positive way you have responded to some of the issues in terms of clarifying and extending the childminder eligibility for support payments. Um, the, your positive response to requests for improved engagement with the childcare sector, perhaps via a childcare forum, and you may have heard a request for at, at this emergency stage for a, a, a weekly engagement with childcare sector representatives, and indeed for that important clarification you've provided as to the the safety based rationale for the difference in the key worker lists. Um, given the difference between school and childcare and childminding settings and, and your commitment to keep that definition under review. I, I think it is important that we recognise the way in which you have proactively responded to those particular issues and of course for the work that you are doing to try to deliver um, a, a childcare support scheme but there will be some other questions as well. So allow me to bring in Robin Newton, MLA. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I thank, thank the delegation for coming uh, today. I, I suppose, Chair, your words there are kind of summing up my feelings as well, that the positive uh, response at this stage that the Department have made, I, I think, is, is welcomed. I think the recognition that the initial forms were complex uh, in their design it is a welcome uh, step, step uh, forward. And I think many don't understand, uh, Eilish, Eilish, the four component parts of it. But maybe that's something that uh, you, you could take a look at. Uh, in terms of, uh, and I'll only make this comment, Chair, because uh, to our previous delegation, I read a part of an email that, that had been sent to me by someone involved in the sector. Um, she makes the point that uh, they were, we are professional and we are regulated, but we're not treated uh, as such. Um, and there is a need to listen uh, to the news to hear what's going on. I think you, you've indicated, uh, Eilish, that uh, you recognise that communications maybe had not been uh, the best uh, and the need to work to, to get those right. 
I think uh, certainly those representing the sector um, have recognised the need for communications and are, are seeking uh, stronger communications, better channels of communications with you. But I think, Chair, uh, all in all, I think your words kind of summar summarise my, my position as well. Okay, thanks, thanks Robin. Can I, can I bring in William Humphrey as well then at that point? <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, Elish, Tina, Cathy, thank you very much for your presentation. I don't know whether you heard uh, any of the contributions earlier from the delegation that we had at the outset of our meeting, uh, but I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Initially, what I wanted to say uh, to you all was to thank you very much indeed uh, for the work that you're doing uh, across both departments in which you, you work. Um, we are in an unprecedented hugely difficult, complex and dangerous situation uh, and none of us obviously have been there before and never want to be there again. So thank you very much for all that you continue to do for our people. It seemed to me, and the Chair touched on it earlier, uh, there was the suggestion from Philip Delgetti about weekly um, video links or phone-ins or whatever linkages. It, it just seemed to me listening, and I'm not in any way criticising anybody here, it just seemed to me listening to the presentation from the folk earlier, the recurrent thing seemed to be, and clearly the way you have set things out here for us um, in your presentation today, a considerable corpus of work has been done, and I thank you for that, but there seems to be, and I'm not attributing blame, but there does seem to be a problem of the sharing of information and communication. And, and I, w I think perhaps that might be one way in which we can address some of the issues, concerns and, and fears that folk had earlier. Uh, that will be it, Chair. OK, thank you, William. Uh, <coughs> Daniel McCrossan. Chair, the, the presentation, the, the line was very bad, and I'm going to just hold back on questions for now. OK. Um, I, I bring you back in if you if you wish later on, Daniel. Okay, Robbie Butler. Yep, thank you, Chair. I just want to echo the thoughts of some of the other members there with regard to the um, availability of the, the, the guys there to come in. Maybe two or three weeks, two weeks earlier than, than they were supposed to, and probably on the back of the meetings we have had with the sector. I would just like to make a point, and it might be a bit of a question. Um, in fact, it is a, it is a question. So, and, and, and I think it was Elise that, that pointed out that some of the um, amendments that have been made to the process so far, and I do understand the need to be fiscally responsible with the money that we've received. However, um, we, we also seem to, and this isn't just uh, with this scheme, but there is um, a, a paralysis by analysis at times, and we are in unprecedented times. And I think in terms of that balance, what we need to look at is the, the risk of this sector collapsing uh, during this crisis and many of those who provide the service not being able to be established again, particularly in the early years um, uh, arena. And I'm just thinking in terms of that, when we do that risk assessment, um, uh, can it not be collated, recorded, that, that the decisions that are made to make the money available to keep these businesses viable was based on the fact that the bigger risk was losing the sector or crippling the sector? And, and creating something that, that is almost unrecoverable on the other side. I don't want to make it sound too dramatic, but I do believe that this isn't a, this isn't a high pay, uh, rich sector. This is a sector which provides an, an incredible uh, resource, especially in those early years. Um, and it's, it's the reward for it. And many times is isn't fiscal. It's, it's what you get out of, of what you put into the kids. Okay. Any officials wish to respond at this point? Okay. So can I, is that right here, um, sir, can I pick up on a, on a number of um, points that have been um, made, um, starting um, with um, when you can point about core components parts and to the scheme. Um, am, I, am I clear? Eilish, no, yeah, sorry, just to cut across you there. We're, we're really struggling to pick you up there. Really bad, yeah. I've just put the hand set again, and is that any better? That's slightly better. If you could speak as loudly and clearly as possible, thanks. Okay, so I'm responding to the point about um, the four component parts of the scheme and how we've designed um, the application forms um, around that. 
Now, can I just say that um, we did have a single application form with all four schemes in, uh, in that single form um, at one stage. And um, BSO, um, which I have to accept, has experience in doing this kind of thing, which I don't have, um, advised that we should actually separate them out and that that would be um, clearer for people who were actually making um, applications. So that's the reason why we have done it in the way that we have done it um, on the advice of, of BSO. Um, there will be guidance um, to support um, the application form. Um, so each, each of them will have its own um, set of guidance. And, and we did take the opportunity to actually share drafts of the application form with, um, uh, with, with members of the sector. Um, and, uh, and any comments that they had on those, um, we have tried as best we can um, to take them on board. So that, that's, that's my response um, to that um, point. I mean, uh, on the comms point, I, I, I have accepted um, that um, we didn't always get it right, um, and I welcome the suggestion possibly um, to do something um, possibly on a weekly um, basis, um, although we're going to have to keep that proportionate um, too over the course of the next um, couple of months, but certainly um, we will endeavour, or I will give the committee a commitment um, that we will ensure that our expectations are better um, uh, going forward than they, ha they have been um, to date. Um, what, Robbie Butler picked up on, on the point about um, sustainability, and I mean, obviously, by having a sustainability element um, within the package, um, the aim is to enable um, settings to get back up and running again as and when um, parents um, need their services, and, and hopefully that point will um, come sooner um, rather, rather than later. So I, I do accept the point um, that we do need to start to get money flowing um, quite quickly um, to settings, and the advice that we've given to um, BSO is that they should quickly make payments for month one, and any verification, etc., that needs to be done um, after that can be picked up in months two and three. So that, that is about getting money into the sector as quickly um, as possible, if that provides any level of reassurance. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to come back in, Robert? No, just to say that, that I really appreciate being picked up um, by Yili, sir. It's just, I, I do, I, for me, the, the bigger risk is the on-ramp and ensuring that we have those good resources that we've built up uh, for our children. Because, and it ties back in, guys, to, to, men, to, to the mental health uh, drive. It, that I'm, I'm, I'm driving in every, in every discussion that they can have, and we want to make sure that in that cumulative societal piece that we don't lose any of the good work that has been achieved to this stage. So thank you for that, Elish. That was that was very clear. Thank you. Okay, Elish, can I just build in on, on Robbie's question? Um, there there does seem to be a perception amongst uh, childcare providers that the the extent of the eligibility criteria and up and application process that is being applied to them is disproportionate with that of other grant support, of other COVID-related grant support being provided by the executive, for example, in relation to other uh, businesses. Um, how, how would you respond to that? Um, in, in response um, to, I mean, each of, some of the forms have got very little information um, required within them. So for a childminder, for example, um, there aren't um, great demands in terms of the completion of the application form. Likewise, the, um, the approved from child care bit of the scheme, I, I think that that application form should be relatively um, simple um, to complete. The, the other two forms um, I accept are a bit more complicated in the sense that they require more information um, to be included in them. But I consider that it's probably the minimum information that we would want um, from settings. So using open settings as an example, um, we've asked them to identify um, their costs, both in, in core cost terms and staffing um, terms. We've asked them then to identify any income um, that they have, and that might be 
income um, as a result of government funding, which is COVID-related, income as a result of government funding, funding which is non-COVID-related, um, and then the third source of income is parental and fees. I think that's the minimum that we could absolutely ask for in that okay. particular um, application form. Okay. What, what, we, what we try to do in terms of core costs is to um, identify what we consider to be um, broad headline um, at core costs, um, and, and, and they were they, they were suggested by um, the sector, okay. and, and we took their suggestions on, on, on board. Okay. Um, so all I'm trying to reflect is where we can keep it simple, we've, we've done that, um, but there are certain parts of the scheme that require a minimum, um, a minimum amount of information, and we've tried to stick to the minimum okay. um, that we can. Okay, and, and that might allow me just to ask a, a, a related questions. Um, the, some feedback suggests that those that uh, that cost coverage in in some way doesn't allow for um, administrative pro professional uh, based staff um, that are employed directly by an organisation, but it does cover that type of service if it is provided from outside of the organisation. Could you speak to that? Um. The, the only thing that I will say in response to that is, um, uh, after this meeting, um, we will go and look at that particular uh, issue to see exactly what, what, what the okay. issue is. Fair enough. Um, and, 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 and seek to address it if we can. Fair enough. And in, in terms of some of the other uh, eligibility criteria then, maybe not necessarily application based, but in terms of eligibility criteria, uh, another concern has been that 25% of um, children uh, attending quota in order to uh, be open um, and the need for trust approval to open which I believe may require trust panel approval which sits on a monthly basis. Could you speak to some of those issues? Okay, so there's, there's two points to the 25%. Um, 25 percent, and it was only a guy. You know, we're not absolutely saying that um, if you've got um, 100 registered places, that you must fill 25 of them. That's not what we have said. It, it is a guide to be applied by Health and Social Care Trust um, early years teams. But th there, there are two reasons for it. Number one, um, we don't want a huge number of children um, in the setting. That's 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 one reason um, for it. But the second reason is that. There has to be a sufficient number of children um, or, or, or a sufficient level of demand um, to make it um, possible or, or, or to make it a, 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 a possible for a setting and to open. Okay. I mean, what, what we don't want is, you know, small pockets of provision um, across um, Northern Ireland that actually may not be um, viable simply because you haven't got a number of children coming um, through the door. Now, I mean, I said that the HSC Trust Early Year, year teams are part of that decision-making um, process, and, and that was done deliberately because they are the people who are closest to these settings. Okay. They, they know them, they register them, they inspect them. Um, and what we've asked um, Trust to do is, is to work with settings to okay. enable them to re reopen. So if we can work towards 25%, I'm content with that, on condition that we don't have a large number of um, settings open across um, the country with two and three children in them. That just does not make economic sense. I think that, I, I think and I hope that that would be some helpful clarification to providers that that is indeed a, a, a guide. Um, can, can you speak to, I, I appreciate as well, perhaps why our leaders teams would be involved in that process then? It, is that going to be a lengthy process? Is it a once monthly process? I, I certainly advise um, the Health and Social Care Board that has been working um, with Health and Social Care Trust that I don't want this to be a bureaucratic um, process at all. So, for example, um, it came to my attention yesterday um, that we involve um, a panel in decisions about um, reopening, and I've made it very clear um, that that needs to be a simple process executed um, quickly. 
Um, I certainly do not want something um, rumbling on for um, a long period of time before a decision uh, is made. So if you're asking me if we will keep it bureaucratically um, as simple as possible, that certainly is the, the intention. Okay, that further helpful clarification. Thanks for that, Eilish. Um, okay, keen to bring in other members. Catherine Kelly. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you all for meeting with us today. It's such short notice um, and at a critical time for childcare. No one is in any doubt at the amount of hard work you're currently undertaking, and I thank you for that. However, today we have heard from providers, and they have used words such as decimation and catastrophic when talking about the childcare sector. This sector has worked so, so hard across the North for many years, um, supporting families and children, and I have seen firsthand the work that goes on, having previously worked in a setting myself. This support package has been a long time coming, seven weeks and counting, as application forms have still not been received. I've, I've been speaking to many providers from West Tyrone and indeed across the North who are at absolute crisis point and under enormous pressure. I find it difficult to actually express the measurable financial stress that they are currently under. Many have welcomed the package, apart from the fact that currently, as Chris said, only 80% of fixed costs are being met. Um, and also, we've already spoken about the key worker list. Um, and they're also worried about how incredibly lengthy and bureaucratic the application process is. Many are frustrated at the fact that other sectors were able to avail of a grant with very little red tape involved, um, where they feel they're having to jump through how to avail of the scheme. Um, they feel let down and justifiably angry. I am, however, glad to hear that you may be bringing forward um, the idea of a forum and weekly communication. Um, I believe this is crucial for providers to ensure that they can inform their staff and the families of the children that they care for. Has planning started for the future of the sector? Um, on the other side of this health crisis, seeing as the recent package has taken seven weeks and is still not actually in place. Eilish? Sure, do you want me to come back in at that point? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I, I've addressed a number of the points that were, were made um, by um, Catherine, including the definition and the application and process. Um, uh, yeah. 80% 80 I covered in the opening um, remarks, um, and we did consider that um, to be a reasonably fair um, settlement, and we have compared it with other jurisdictions, for example, um, the Republic of Ireland, and certainly those two schemes in percentage um, terms are broadly um, similar. Um, I, I think the fact that we have a scheme at all for the sector is an acknowledgement of the importance of the sector in, in, in terms of what it does um, within Northern Ireland. So, I mean, this hasn't been done for other sectors in quite um, the same way, and, and that was the purpose of the scheme. There, there was a process that we had to go through here. You know, we did have to secure the funding. We did have to design a scheme. We did have to work out how um, that, that, that we were going to implement um, that scheme, and we've tried to do that um, at pace. Um, if you ask me, could I have done it any quickly, uh, any more quickly? I'm, I'm honestly not convinced um, that we um, uh, could have. Yeah. In, in terms of the, the final point about recovery, uh, our, our attention has turned towards recovery across all um, parts of um, service provision. You know, so, for example, um, in addition to what we might do to recover the childcare sector, I have now turned my attention and given other policy responsibilities um, to work out how we recover um, children and family and services within health and social care trusts. So recovery uh, is very much on the agenda at the minute, and, and that will apply equally to the childcare sector as it will to any other area of service provision. Yeah, before I bring Catherine back in, um, it, is the Republic of Ireland cost coverage not 100% compared to our 80%? I'll come in at that point. Yep. Um, uh, uh, 
I have looked at the DCYA uh, announcement and also spoken to my colleague in the Republic. Um, what the 100% is in the Republic is 100% of their staffing costs. But staffing costs are not the total operating cost for a setting. So they have provided 70% towards an equivalent of CJRS in the site. And then they have added in another 30%, bringing the staffing costs up to 100%. But they have averaged their staffing costs to be around 70% of operating costs. Then they have applied a percentage towards their fixed costs. And it works out at about 80% of the overall operating cost of a setting. So when you look at the CJRS scheme here, that we have, and then the scheme that the two ministers have put in place for closed schemes, it actually comes out at around the same level of funding, because the sector told us that um, staffing costs are around 79%. 10% of all settings costs aren't incurred when they're closed, and that leaves 11% of fixed costs, and we're providing 80% of those fixed costs. The COVID job retention scheme is covering 80% of staff costs if they're furloughed, and then 10% of costs aren't being incurred because the setting is closed. So okay. we have tried to make the comparison across the schemes. Okay, thanks. Catherine, do you want to come back in? Just one final question, and thank you for that, for that Eilish. Um, have you any advice for providers whose daycare is closed, although two staff are currently providing home childcare for key workers? This provider she's worried that this will jeopardise her application for financial support for a closed setting. Would this be the case? Uh, absolutely not. Um, Catherine, um, you know, so we... we um, have asked closed providers or indeed open um, providers to support um, the approved home childcare scheme. And again, that was all about trying to get children minded in their own um, homes, which he thought was probably a safe, a, a, a safe method of care, um, if I can put it um, that way. So in terms of whether or not they will actually be penalised in, in any way, absolutely not, um, because we're recognising that we actually need their support to make um, the approved home child care scheme work at, at all. So they will continue to make applications um, for uh, uh, to the closed bit of the um, scheme and, and will be compensated up to the levels that we have um, set um, within that part of the scheme. And I, I hope that that will actually be reflected um, in the guidance. I, I am going to go back again on the, on, on the back of this question to make absolutely certain that that is abundantly um, clear to any setting that is closed. Brilliant. Thank you, Eilish. Okay, Catherine. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Morris Bradley. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, most of the questions have already been answered, but uh, just a wee bit of clarity is needed. And thank you very much for your hard work uh, and your presentation today. But really, what the crux of the matter is uh, more information is needed, less complexity. Uh, an application for funding and an expedient release of funding. That, that seems to be what most people want. Do you, you hear that, Chair? Uh, say again, Morris. Uh, yeah. Uh, just thanking everybody for their presentation uh, and every, uh, all the answers so far. But uh, what's coming clear to me is uh, more information is needed less complexity in the application for funding and an expedient release of funding is, is what everybody wants at the minute, I think. I think that's, yeah, fair, fair summary, Morris. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, that's, that's it, that. okay. Justin McNulty. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Yelish, uh, Paul, Tina and Cathy for your presentation so far and for your answers to this point. Eilish, you mentioned looked after children. Are you confident that, um, given the knowledge we now have in terms of spike in domestic abuse, are you confident that every child is being appropriately reached out to and 
church for by an appropriate um, services to ensure that no child is unsafe at home because of this lockdown. I mean, I can't give you an absolute guarantee of that, nor would you expect me to give you an absolute guarantee of that. But um, one of the things that we are doing at the minute, and it's being done on a cross-departmental um, basis, is developing um, what we're calling a vulnerable children um, plan. And that plan will set, be, will set out um, what is being done across the departments of health, education, communities and justice. <laughs> Um, to ensure that we are keeping vulnerable children as um, safe as possible. Um, and you're right, um, domestic violence is a particular issue. Um, we know that there has been an increase in, in, in the rate of, of um, domestic violence. Um, that's where daycare in part comes in, or childcare in part comes in, um, and why we opened the scheme to vulnerable children, um, because the aim is to actually get some of those children out of home and into um, childcare at least for a portion of the day or for a number of days um, in, in, in the week. But in response to your question, are we looking at this? Absolutely, um, we are. Uh, and that vulnerable children plan um, will be taken to the executive um, at some point. I don't think it's just a plan for the minute in terms of um, getting us through the pandemic. Um, our um, concerns are also um, relating to what happens on the other side of the pandemic when lockdown, et cetera, um, uh, comes to an end. Um, so the plan is, is partly about um, to address um, uh, that um, also. Okay, thanks, Gail. It's, just, it's reassuring to know and to hear that you're proactively uh, seeking to address this very, very important matter. So thank you for that. Um, you mentioned also we have the key worker list definition. And I'm still, I'm still confused as to why there's two different lists. Okay, so um, the, the, the definition that we apply to daycare, and I said it in the opener remarks, is, is much more limited and much more restricted than the definition that was applied by um, the Department of Education in relation to the reopening um, of schools. Now, there's a very evident um, reason um, for that, um, and, and it's simply space-related, physical space-related. It is possible, given um, the, um, the size of a school, for example, um, to keep children um, further um, apart in a daycare setting. Um, the scope to do that is more um, limited, and that was the reason um, for us setting the definitions um, differently. But, but we have given a, a commitment, and, and there have been calls for us to do it over the course of the last couple of weeks, to keeping the definition um, under review. And, and, and if there is a, a, a sense or evidence to suggest um, that we can provide care safely um, to a wider group of parents, we will absolutely, um, uh, we will absolutely do that. Um, but I wouldn't do it um, without um, seeking um, the advice of um, public health experts in, in, in making a final uh, decision. Okay, thanks, Yelish. Um, just to clarify that the 25% is actually the actual threshold for reopening of Calipers Tricare settings. Sorry, I, I didn't get that um, question. Sorry, is it 25%? Is that the threshold for the reopening of childcare settings? Okay, so I, 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 I think I've tried to indicate that yeah, we yeah, set 25% yeah. for, for, for a reason and, and explain that it is a guide to be used by health and social care. Um, trust in making decisions about um, who stays open and, and who reopens. Okay, thanks, Josh. And uh, are you confident that any necessary support and guidance are or will be in place to allow the child for a second to reboot to full capacity, and that is the new full capacity as and when required with all the necessary measures and protocols in place? And that, that will be part of recovery planning that I've already um, referred to. Um, so where guidance is, is needed um, to assist um, with um, recovery, guidance will be provided. And are you confident that can happen? That the, that the, the trade for secondary sector to reboot as and when required, are you confident that can happen as things stand, as, as you have things in place at this point? In, in terms of the capacity of the sector to, to reopen, is that, is that your yeah. point? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's part of the, the purpose of, of the scheme um, itself, include, and in particular the, the sustainability elements of the, of the scheme. 
So we, we want people to be able to meet any costs that they incur um, over the course of, uh, of the three months from April um, to June. And the whole purpose of that is to ensure that they are viable and continue um, to be viable so that as and when um, doors need to reopen, um, they are in a position um, to do that. That, that. That's the purpose of that part of the scheme. Okay, and thank you. Thank you, Paul, Tina, Chappie, for your efforts. Appreciate them coming in from them today. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Chair, if I could just come in. Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, Chair. Uh, sorry, a bit earlier. Uh, and uh, thank you to our guests for their presentation and apologies for this um, poor uh, line today. Uh, hopefully, it will be rectified going forward. Um, ju just to pick up on a number of points and some of the information that was gathered earlier in the week, and this may have been covered, but I haven't picked it up because of the line. Um, there's a concern that 20% of the sector uh, will be uh, very badly affected and that will be facing a substantial redundancy um, and that they won't reopen their doors. I'll, some would argue that a key contributing factor in that would have been the slow pace in which this scheme has come about uh, in terms of reacting to this crisis. And now, first of all, I entirely appreciate that these are unprecedented times and we've all been uh, affected uh, directly in relation to it and that departments have had to respond. But many within the sector would argue that this hasn't moved quite quickly enough. And it seems to be a trend, really, from the various departments, as I've touched on earlier. Would you agree, or what information have you got in relation to the levels of uh, the sector that will not reopen the stores again in terms of um, how this has impacted them? Uh, and obviously, as well, the redundancies that will follow through from that. My concern is the impact that will have, and the knock-on impact that will have on the economy, because it will have present the difficulties in people returning to work smoothly. And I think that's what Justin's point was and the governors about rebooting as soon as we get through this. I, I certainly haven't um, got the information that um, you have uh, suggested that maybe has come our way. Um, no, nothing to suggest that 20% of the sector is, is really badly affected and, and may not reopen. Um, its doors um, at the end of, of, of this. So, I mean, that's as much as I can say in response um, to the question that you have asked. Yeah, well, that, that's certainly what we're hearing, uh, and it is very worrying. And we've also been told to expect significant redundancies. And unfortunately, yep. Daniel, that may be the case um, across a lot of um, sectors at the end of um, this. Um, it may not only be the childcare sector that is um, affected, there might be significant numbers of individuals un un unemployed, um, and that will only become apparent in time. But w why then are so many um, saying the same thing in relation to the pace in which their, the response has come uh, in designing this scheme has had a direct impact and influence? as to whether or not they will reopen? I mean, I, I, I've talked about pace and, and um, I've explained why it has taken as, as long as it has to get the um, scheme up and running, which in the, which in the scheme of things actually isn't a huge um, period of time. Um, if you ask me, um, could we have done this more quickly? Um, you know, we may have shaved um, a week um, off it, possibly two weeks off it, but I think um, it is required is this length of time to get the scheme up and running. Our attention now needs to be on getting money out the door, and, and hopefully, um, the, the, not, not hopefully, the application form will application process will start tomorrow, and, and we will aim to get money out the door as quickly as possible. Yeah, so, so we're seven weeks in now at this stage, um, and. Uh money is only going to be ruled out from tomorrow, as you've said. How, how, how long will it take to process the, the, this entire... Like, in other words, will people still be waiting in two weeks' time? Will they be waiting in three weeks' time? Will they be waiting in four weeks' time? Or is this a very quick process? 
Um, Daniel, it's Cathy here again. Um, I mean, certainly take your point and um, we would understand the vulnerabilities of the childcare sector who are, you know, mostly um, reliant on parental fees and, uh, as income. You know, we don't have the schemes that are in place in England and, and Wales. And that has probably added to some of the vulnerabilities, and that, that's something that we will be looking at uh, through the child care, the executive child care strategy in, in due course. Um, but that said, this scheme, this, this package of measures, is actually trying to address some of the vulnerabilities specific to this sector. And the CJRS, the COVID job retention scheme, is actually aimed at preventing redundancies, you know, where where possible, um, and uh, the the money and the, the payments that will be made through this child care scheme are designed to help address the costs that are unavoidable for settings. And the only thing we can say is that as soon as the applications go out, and as soon as the information comes back in, every effort will be made to pay. Um, to make those payments as quickly as possible, and and probably for April and May, so and they'll be backdated to when the setting closed or the first of April. Yeah, so um, they will be backdated. The money will be made available as quickly as practical as we can practically manage. Yeah, and and I appreciate your answer in that regard, but it still gives me considerable concern, as I'm sure it does other members. In terms of the application process, when those, proce when those applications are returned, how quickly can they be processed? Have, is there the capacity to get these processed quickly? Should there be a surge in applications at any one time? Or will people be waiting a week, two weeks, three weeks? Similar to the, I'm sure you've seen over the news, the business grant scheme, which seven weeks later, six weeks later, was business still haven't received. I'm just concerned that so when these applications are ruled out, how quickly can they be processed and how quickly can we get to the other end? So the, B, the BSO, Daniel, has given a, a commitment um, to turn application forms around as quickly um, as possible. If you're asking me to put a time frame of one week, two weeks, three weeks on it, I can't do that for you um, just at the minute, and you may not be um, satisfied with that. What we have done is we have put additional resource into the BSO, um, to um, make that more possible um, than not. So we will be paying for additional uh, members of staff and we are using um, uh, staff in a, in a, in a redeployed um, way um, within the BSO um, to make that possible. Um, there is a key role, I think, for um, sectoral organisations too, and I, I refer to a number of them, um, EYO, um, NICMA Playboard and Employers for Childcare, to work as closely as possible um, with individuals making applications um, to make certain that all of the information that needs to be provided is provided um, and that um, reduces any risk of application forms um, having um, to be returned, um, for, for example. So the aim is to do it as quickly as possible, um, uh, 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 Daniel, and we put additional resource in place um, to hopefully um, uh, make that more possible than not. Well, I, I, I don't mean to be in any way uh, flippant or dismissive at all when I say what I'm about to say, but for me to have any confidence in this process and to give an assurance to the many constituents across my constituency and beyond that are very concerned about this in its current situation, I would be more satisfied, as would other members, with a more suitable answer in terms of the time frame. And I don't mean to be blunt in that, but this is a very serious situation. You've heard other members explain how serious it is. You know how serious it is. Uh, and in terms of sheer numbers, how many, for instance, in the BSO, many staff are there at the minute? How many will be processing at the minute, including the additional staff? There will be, I think, around five members of staff involved in, in processing um, application forms. And, and, and the point I want to make is that they're, they're very experienced members um, of staff who are used to doing um, this kind of um, thing. So my expectation is that they will be able to do it um, quite efficiently. One thing that we can do as departments is to commit to coming back to the committee um, to provide a new with an update on how the application process is, is working and how quickly um, it is um, working, if that satisfies members to any extent. 
I, I, I appreciate the offer uh, in relation to that, but I, I'm just concerned here. So five members of staff, I have no question that they're very experienced, as many of our people are within the system who are under immense pressure as a result of this entire crisis, uh, and we've seen that. Uh, are you satisfied that five members is sufficient for a very quick turnover of applications being processed and money being put out the door? How many applications in a day can each of those individuals process? I haven't got that information um, for you um, at all. The only other thing that I can commit to doing is that if um, there isn't capacity within the BSO um, to turn application forms um, around quickly, then we will put additional resource in there to make that um, possible or to speed up the process. Okay. Daniel, I need us to wrap up here. Can you Chair, have a final just have question? To, just have to make a point, Chair, yep. and I'm going to stress this very, very, very much. It is vitally important for this sector that money is put out as quickly and as swiftly as possible, and it is the responsibility of the department to ensure that that is the case. And I would suggest that five members is not enough, that extra resources should be put in immediately, and we should be seeking to turn this over as quickly as possible to protect the sector and ensure certainty and reassurance for the people that are very worried and continue to be. And I appreciate the offer of returning to this committee to provide a further update, but every day is critical and crucial, and I'm not happy to wait a week or two weeks for an update. I want an update, and I'd suggest and, uh, and appeal to you to have an update to us on those sheer numbers as to what the turnover rate could be uh, by the end of this week, if possible. Okay, Daniel, thank you. Um, thank you for your response. Uh, officials, members, I, I need to bring us to a close. Um, officials, in, in closing, can I, I say that you've obviously heard and are no doubt aware of serious concern for the sustainability of the childcare sector, a sector that is key to the development of children and our economy. And I thank you for the open and responsive way in which you've engaged with those issues today. I think we gave you less than two days working notice to attend the session today, and I think um, you have responded as openly as any government officials have on any COVID-19 related scheme. So we, we thank you for that. You've also made um, some constructive uh, commitments there in terms to, of um, engagement with the childcare sector, and hopefully, from the childcare sector's point of view, been able to provide some reassurance with regards to um, reviewing um, as uh, guidelines permit the like of the key worker list, um, and assured us that the the twenty five percent quota. Um, is a guidance and that you have asked Trust uh, to uh, be proactive in its approval of schemes to reopen. Um, can I, in line with the suggestion of updates, um, we, we receive a, a weekly COVID-19 situation report from the Department of Education um, and from the Permanent Secretary, if, if, it was, if it could be possible to include updates on the child care support scheme in that situation report and hopefully once the vulnerable children action plan is in place updates on that as well um, and your commitment to stay in contact us with us on these matters is that okay officials okay do you like to make any closing remarks <coughs> Ailish or Cathy, do you want to make any closing remarks? No, just, just thank you to the committee um, for your, your time this morning. We have provided some level um, of assurance to you, and we are committed um, to getting applications and processed as quickly as possible and want the money out the door. Thank you, and, and we, we, we wish you well in, in urgent delivery of that scheme that is uh, so desperately needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, if I can move us promptly on to the next uh, aspect of this session, which is our oral briefing from the Department of Education Permanent Secretary. Um, can I refer members to uh, SIA response on examination arrangements at page 23? Uh, 
and our latest Department of Education COVID-19 situation report in tabled items. Uh, a letter to the Minister regarding substitute teachers, which the committee sent earlier this week in tabled items, and a response from the Education Authority regarding payments to bus and taxi operators. Uh, can I check then that we have Derek Baker, Permanent Secretary of the Department of Education with us? Yes, good morning, Chair. Okay, you're very welcome. Derek, you'd like to make some opening remarks? Okay, Chair, thank you. C can you hear me okay? There's, there's a real echo in this. Yeah, I, I can hear you clearly. Can members hear Permanent Secretary clearly? Yes, yeah. Yeah, okay. the echo's calling. It, it's also my understanding that despite our difficulties at hearing uh, contributors um, within the Assembly and at home today, that it has been uh, broadcast clearly, um, which is hopefully some reassurance. But Derek, if I invite you to start your briefing, thanks. Okay, Chair, thank you. You have got the written report. I'll assume that the report has been read, so I'm not going to go through it to you. Um, I'm conscious that the report is getting bigger every week, but what we try to do is focus on the updated items at the front end of the report, and then the consolidated material at the back end of the report, just for reference purposes. But if the committee has any suggestions on how the report can be made more helpful, I'd be more than happy to take that into account. Um, running through the work streams very, very briefly, uh, first of all, on A, you are aware that the Finance Minister and Education Minister uh, are both awaiting a response from Treasury in respect of accessing the job retention scheme. Um, I know that the Department of Finance is pressing Treasury on that, uh, and we hope to get a response very soon. On meals, the arrangements continue to operate reasonably smoothly. The number of payments is going up. Another payment run is due this day week. Um, if, the in, if the increase continues as it is on the current trajectory, we are going to um, have funding issues later in the financial year that we'll have to address. The Youth Services Eat Well, Live Well scheme is operating well, delivering to over 3,000 young people. Um, on vulnerable children, um, I suppose the three things only I would draw attention to Firstly, we expect the first report from the Education Authority tomorrow on the casework loads for all of their vulnerable children services. Secondly, the interdisciplinary panel that we have talked about, our panels that we have previously talked about are now operational. And thirdly, we'll note that the Education Authority has worked with the Health and Social Care Trust to put in place a um, virtual child vulnerable uh, children's group in each trust area to make sure that all the appropriate referrals are being made. Um, there's a little bit more information than normal on continuity of learning or distance learning. I know the committee has owed a detailed paper on this and we intend to get that to the committee before the end of this week. Um, I just want to highlight the fact that we do have a formal program of work on this issue in the department in conjunction with our statutory partners and the inspectorate. Um, we're looking across the board at each of the work streams in preschool, primary, post-primary, special education and Irish medium. Um, we are trying to establish what is happening out there, where the gaps are, how best we can fill those gaps, disseminating resources, disseminating best practice. Um, but there will be a more detailed briefing on distance learning coming later this week to the committee. The point I would stress is that we're looking not just at the here and now, but um, as I think I've said previously, if and well, when schools do return to a normal semblance of working, um, we must make an assumption, uh, and I can't be sure about this, but we make an assumption that it could be on the basis of some kind of blended learning, as a combination of in-school learning and distance learning. So we need to prepare for that as well. On examinations, the big issue, the next big public issue, will be consultation by the ICA on an appeals process. 
and we are anticipating that issuing later this week. Finally, on the key workers' arrangements, uh, the numbers continue to rise gently. Um, the committee's numbers um, relate to the 20th of April. As of yesterday, actually, 479 schools were open and we had 1,388 pupils attending. And I think that's the second highest number ever since the 23rd of March. So there seems to be a gradual increase in the number of schools opening, the number of pupils attending, but the system is still able to cope reasonably well at local level. And obviously, the committee has just had a detailed briefing on child care arrangements, and I just caught the tail end of that. And I call chair your request for update uh, in our progress report on child care arrangements. Certainly, try to accommodate. That's all I said, stage chair. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much indeed, um, Derek, and our ongoing thanks to the work of you and your officials in responding to this emergency. Um, can I start by asking? if you have an update with regards to the commencement of special educational needs uh, and children with complex needs interdisciplinary panels to ensure that the services they would access at special school are being in some way maintained during social isolation? Yeah. As I said, the interdisciplinary panel process has started. So the intention of that is to make sure that for each and every case that is considered, the uh, needs of those children are being met. So um, I will need to get an update on how that process is going. I don't think I can respond at a generic level, as each case is different. The intention is to work through the individual referrals, whether they come from schools themselves or whether they come from health and social services themselves. So I don't think a generic response is appropriate in that it's really about the individual pupils and their needs being met. Okay. I'm, I'm not getting a sense from families that I'm in contact with that they have been engaged with an interdisciplinary panel or that an interdisciplinary panel is resulting in support being delivered to them at this stage. I, I would be reassured if we can get to the point where I am not in that position in the next weeks. I follow that up, Chair. I mean, I think, you know, uh, it will be an important outcome of the work of those panels that needs are being met. So I will follow that up. Okay, thank you. Another question is that I've raised previously, and I realise there may not be a straightforward solution to it, is that the, uh, for families who do not have a bank account um, are not currently receiving the free school meal payments. Um, has the department managed to find a way to um, deliver those free school meal payments that they need and to which they're entitled to families without bank accounts? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, would, I would go back to first principles here in that the objective of this is not really about delivering payments but delivering food. So, as you are aware, we are making payments in bank accounts. Where bank accounts do not exist, the Education Authority is contacting each and every family individual individually to ask for bank account details or indeed to provide support to those families to open a bank account or to convert a post office account into a bank account. There is a specific helpline for that purpose. Where that is not possible, Families are being referred to the COVID Community Response Helpline, operated by Department for Communities, which will ensure that any family hardship which is in need of food will receive food. I think we've explained, obviously, that the system that is being used for this, and it wasn't the purpose for which it is designed, cannot pay into a post office account, can pay into a bank account, and from a technical point of view, the risk was too high to pull it down and reconfigure this. Otherwise, we jeopardise the existing payments in respect of almost 100,000 children. But we will work hard to make sure that each and every family, child is entitled to a free school meal, gets access to a meal, 
through one of the safety net mechanisms in place, be that Department for Communities or be it the Education Authority Services. Eat well, live well, program. Okay. Uh, has AQE and PPTC written to the Minister or requested uh, from the Minister that the Department and the Education Authority delay the Pope's primary transfer process for 2021? Both organisations have been in correspondence with the Minister, but not in the last week or so. Um, we have been talking to both organisations to understand better what their proposals are for transfer tests, and they have to come back to us with those proposals. Our concern is to make sure that Transfer 2021 operates in a smooth and orderly way and that any proposals from AQE and PPTC um, accommodate our requirements in that regard. So I think the position is likely to become clearer over the coming weeks because both organisations are actively considering the arrangements they need to put in place and we will then need to make that is complied with our requirements. Um, I know the committee also wrote to us asking for contacts with both organisations. I don't know whether that issue has been disposed of and whether you've managed to make contact it, with them. It has, thanks. We've, we've established contact and I think we'll be meeting, we'll be meeting with them next week. Um, yeah. Okay. Final question for me before I bring other members in, uh, Derek, is obviously um, it's a priority issue for this committee to advocate on behalf of the substitute teachers facing significant hardship at this time. And can you provide an update with regards to any payment for substitute teachers? I can't share over and above what I said at the start of my oral update. Um, we await a response to the letter from the Finance Minister and the Education Minister jointly to Treasury. Um, and I know Department of Finance are pushing that hard, and we're actually pushing Department of Finance to push for a response uh, so that we get a definitive position on this and can move ahead one way or another. If we do not get access to external help, then, as the Minister has said, and I think the, the Minister was questioned in the Assembly yesterday about this, we will have to look to our own internal resources, which obviously is going to be very difficult. But I accept, Chair, fully accept that this is an issue that needs to be resolved very, very quickly now because it has drifted on too long. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen Mullen, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Derek, for your update. Um, my line is very bad and there's an echo. So um, I'm just going to go over all of it. And if you want to come on at the end, if that's okay. Karen, yes. Karen, Karen we, we can hear you reasonably clearly. So um, be reassured okay. about that. Okay, uh, go ahead. Thank you. So, Derek, um, I know you came on there at the end. We've just heard from the child care sector that childcare sector earlier this morning and the department and I just really want to raise the point with you. It was very concerning to hear from the department um, that the application process is only starting and following Diana McCarson's question in there at the end that no time frame could be given to us today as to when organisations will first receive payments. I would again uh, appeal to you to ask and ask that you do all you can to ensure the resources are in place within the department to get those applications turned around and get the financial support out. Um, in relation to the substitute teachers that Chris had on there, just sort of making the point, I am aware of the process that you're involved in now and the update you gave us this morning and the minister yesterday. Just sort of making the point that uh, if substitute teachers are, already, are usually paid from the department and school budgets, uh, if schools had been open, those teachers would have had to be paid April to June, um, and maybe that's the option that you're looking at um, in relation to can that, move, can that money be used um, for that if we don't get it from either the Treasury or the Department of Finance. I know the appeal has been made these on many occasions, and these are working very, very hard to get that in place. So it's just really a point, not a question. 
And the last point Chris had raised it as well around the free school meals. I have been contacted again this week um, by families around the, the bank account. Um, and my point on it is uh, I, I don't really understand why the Education Authority cannot process a cheque for these people. I know they have been directed to the, the different food banks or food box schemes um, that is out there. I am being told that the eat well is at full capacity and aren't taking any more referrals. So maybe you could confirm that for me. I'm also being contacted by some parents who, through no fault of their own, have been told that they will not, even though the payment now is coming in, that these payments, the money they would be owed through backdated, will not be backdated. Um, and I think that that needs to be re re rectified because, as I say, through no fault of their own, um, there was a delay in payment, and we need the education authority to get that out. We, as an executive, um, approve funding to provide uh, the support to families at this time, and we need to ensure that that's going out. And if you could just provide us, well, maybe not today, but maybe after this, how many families have not received the free school payment, and uh, you know, um, maybe detail the reasons as to why that is it just the bank account issue at this stage? And that's me. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Derek. Okay, I think I might have the same problem as you, Karen, in that I'm getting an echo, so everything I say comes straight back at me, so it's very difficult to concentrate. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'll do my best to respond. Yeah, I mean, I can only accept your point on childcare, um, and I understand it's important to process this as quickly as possible. I will commit to providing the best information we can by way of ongoing management information uh, on the operation of the scheme and the timeliness of it in our weekly update, and I'll explore that with health colleagues afterwards. Um, on substitute teachers, yeah, you've got the update. Um, I think uh, what, what, one of the issues about payment is that it would be very difficult to take out of schools' budgets money for which they have not received service. But nonetheless, I take your point, if we don't get any external support, the Minister has already said we're going to have to look to our own budget and it will cause us real difficulties, but we will do something, okay? Um, on free school meals, first of all, on your backdating issue, that should not happen. If any individual family was eligible for free school meal from the date at which this scheme started, they should get back payments. And I think the intention is, I was discussing this with one of my colleagues yesterday, the intention is that there will be a mop-up um, later in the life of the scheme to make sure that all back payments that should have been made are made. You are right in that the Eat Well, Live Well scheme has reached the capacity of 3,100 young people whom the youth service targeted. And Unless more money is provided to that scheme, they will have to cap the provision at the 3,100 young people. But we are looking at that with the Education Authority to see what might have to be done. But I think similar problems are facing the Department for Communities as well. What I will also do is go away and look at the check issue again. Okay, There were two issues about processing checks manually. One, it caused social distancing issues within the Education Authority. I will look at that again. Secondly, if we issued checks to individual families, what do they do with those checks? We would be asking those families to go out and make a journey and go into a high street and go into a bank and cash those checks. So we'd actually be obliging people to go out and make another trip. So there is an issue around that. But I will look into the issue for you, and I'll come back next week with an explanation on the checks issue. Um, I think your sorry, I think your final question, Karen, was the numbers of eligible families who are not getting direct payments, and I think we should be able to get that information for you. So I'll provide an update by next week as well. Thank you, Derek. Okay, Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, can I uh, also concur the ne necessity for uh, clarity around the post-primary transfer situation? Uh, I think Derek is becoming uh, more and uh, more important. 
Um, but uh, that's a comment rather than a question. Can, can I thank you and thank your colleagues for all the work you are doing at the moment? But can I pick you up on a remark you made in your introductory remarks? When you said, if and when uh, children return, it may be necessary for some sort of combination of, of approach. Uh, and that might be attendance plus distance learning. Can I ask you maybe to expand on your thinking there and maybe give consideration because, you know, we are now receiving, uh, we're in conversations with the childcare sector. Uh, and uh, if that is a combination of attendance plus distance learning, then that may have uh, fairly major implications for that particular sector. Yes, I'll pick that up. Can I reiterate what I said last week? And I think I said the week before, there is no target date for schools returning. There is no firm plan for schools returning. So I'm only speculating on the future. Um, but we are getting lots of helpful correspondence, I have to say, from school principals, either individually or collectively, with their thoughts and ideas on what the future might home hold. Um, we have to assume that at some stage, schools will return to some semblance of normal activity. But I think the assumption we are all making is that it won't be a big bang approach on day one, that everybody returns to school as normal. So it is quite conceivable that specific groups of pupils' priority cohorts will be targeted for an earlier return than others. For example, one can think of uh, cohorts of pupils doing examinations in transition years or particular groups that you wish to concentrate on, either because they're vulnerable pupils um, or you wish to target them. Similarly, it may well be that those pupils wouldn't be in school full time. They may be in school for part of the week. They may be at school and they may be at home for part of the week and therefore distance learning will have to be facilitated in a more structured and systematic way. Now, I am only speculating. Um, don't please interpret this as firm plans. But as I mentioned last week, we are starting to turn our thoughts to what the conditions might be when schools start to return to normal business and what kind of things we will have to think about. I can assure the committee and indeed anybody else listening from the sector that before we develop any firm plans for this, we will be engaging with schools, with school leaders, with sector bodies and with stakeholders to take the benefit of their views and their wisdom to form our proposals. So that's what lay behind those comments. You would accept, though, Derek, that this is fairly radical thinking and a whole new approach to uh, our traditional way of, of school attendance? Oh, I fully accept that, but look at the situation we currently now have with schools generally closed for business. It doesn't get more radical than that, and it is a very worrying situation for us to be in. And as I've said before, from an educational perspective, this is not where we want to be. But um, I'm making an assumption that returning to normal will be a gradual process and not a big bang process. Now, maybe on the basis of the scientific advice and the public health advice in the future, I will be proved totally wrong. And you know what? I would be delighted to be proved wrong if schools could get back to normal working immediately. But I think we have to prepare sensibly for all eventualities. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, important, important discussion, Robin. Thank you. Uh, Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Chair. Can I add that the approved for some reason? <laughs> You, you've got you've got worse for us, Daniel. So I I'm being spared you, but hopefully Derek can hear you okay. Derek, can you hear me? Yeah. Unfortunately, yes, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, go ahead, I'm Daniel. Daniel. I'm going to be nice. Don't worry. I'm going to be nice. <laughs> um, Derek, just just following on from a number of points, you'll know or expect that I'm going to raise the supply of teachers issue and follow on from yeah. Chris and Byron. Uh We have received huge amounts of correspondence and personal stories uh, from some 
by teachers across the entirety of Northern Ireland. We reached out after last week's committee just to see how it was impacting people on the ground, and those stories, uh, many of which I've shared with the Minister, uh, are, are uh, very, very concerning. Uh, and it has affected the morale of these largely young people who have uh, invested in their education to better the lives of our children and young people out there. Uh, indeed, this entire process has been regrettable. Uh, they feel that they have been forgotten. But I do take the assurance, Derek, from uh, your statement to say that we will do something. That is a reassurance for me uh, that this has been given uh, the necessary consideration uh, and that action has been taken. But I would ask that uh, this, uh, uh, as I've said to uh, the, uh, earlier in, in the meeting, that this happen as swiftly as possible, because these people do have bills to pay, they do have mortgages. Uh, there's people that have been teaching right up until this who have no contract and have been just left in a state of limbo. Uh, and I can tell you it is affecting very much their mental health. It is affecting uh, them directly, uh, and, and they are very, very unhappy. And one said uh, to me, just to, to say that, uh, 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 Daniel, when schools need us, and I can assure you they need us, we are there. Why isn't the department there for us now? And that is a key question. Uh, and I think that uh, the only way to provide an assurance or reassure those people out there uh, who are very worried at this time uh, is that we get this rectified as quickly as possible. Now, I understand you have reached out to the Treasury, and that is a welcome move. But in the, app, in the event that that isn't successful, which I hope it is successful, uh, I would ask that you move as quickly as possible, Derek, to plug this and to ensure that these people get money. This is a very worrying situation, uh, and I know you appreciate that. I, I do that. I, I, take your, I take your point. Can I just say, um, I, I would not like to be sitting in front of you metaphorically next week in the same position. I find this difficult too, so I want this resolved as quickly as possible. Now, some of these things are out with my direct control, but I want this resolved. And uh, I would love it to be resolved before this time next week, so I'm not sitting in front of you saying the same thing again. Okay. Th th thanks, Derek. And, and uh, I was going to say teacher. <laughs> uh, Chair, uh, if, uh, if I could just um, uh, follow on from uh, another few points. It's in relation to statementing, and we've had a number of uh, people uh, contact me as well uh, in, in the, the last week, parents who are concerned that the statementing process is proceeding without face-to-face -face contact between an educational psychologist and the child. Now, obviously, given the crisis, there is an argument for that. But uh, we're just concerned, surely there is a safe way to facilitate this better uh, and that it's not done uh, without due consideration of all the circumstances. And if the children of key workers can go into school, there must be a way for a child who requires a psychology report to meet the, psych the psychologist. And I'm, th th there's parents that have reached out to me this week who, whose children are being considered that haven't had a face-to-face -face or any form of assessment. Uh, and rightly, uh, that parent is concerned in that regard. Yeah, I, I need to... Sorry, I need to defer to the professionals on this issue. Statementing continues, and um, I know that uh, you know educational psychologists, for example, are attempting to do so on the basis of information that is provided on a remote basis. The, I think one of the concerns of the professionals that has been relayed to me, and I don't pretend to be an expert in this, so please forgive me, but attempting to perform a face-to-face -face assessment with a young person um, with full protective equipment on and visors and everything else could actually be a very daunting process for the young person. So I think that's what some educational psychologists are having to take into account in the statementing process. But I will, I will check up your point as to why, um, in principle, it is not possible for a statementing to take pl a statementing process to take place face to face, albeit with social distancing arrangements in place, if that is necessary, and I will try to get an answer for you on that. Yes, uh, and and, uh, and I understand that uh, you're, you're going to, have to see clarity on, on the statementing thing. I had a few other supplementaries in that, Derek, but given what you've said. I'll let you come back to me, and then I'll add to that. But just a, another point that it was, it was briefly touched on, and it was in 
uh, some of the correspondence received last week, and it has been an ongoing part of the discussions between ourselves uh, and, and yourselves as well, uh, and that is in relation to the distance, distance learning, and you'll know that uh, many of us are quite concerned. Uh, we obviously appreciate the circumstances, but we remain concerned, um, particularly in relation to some of the details that have been provided. But I noticed this week in the report provided to this committee uh, within the uh, papers uh, that there is a greater amount of information um, uh, in, the, in this report, and I'm thanking you for that and whoever's prepared it. Um, I'm, ju I'm, just, I'm just keen to know what, what actions have been taken to provide a full assessment as to uh, how uh, effective distance learning is uh, and how children and young people are engaging and tuning in uh, and uh, what the numbers are. Because uh, I'm in a bit of a debate at this at this the minute because on the numbers that I was reading last week, uh, it would state that on a good day, and there was very few of those, there was up to 100,000 children and not beyond it engaging. Uh, and uh, beyond that, uh, there was very, uh, there, there's, there's obviously reasons for that, and that there's nursery places and children below the age of primary two, for instance. But I, I'm just wondering, uh, from primary four up, uh, what the actual numbers are in terms, of, and that's post-primary and primary. What the actual numbers are, and if you have a clear detail of those. Yeah, I think I mean a couple of points, Daniel. First of all, as I said at the start, the committee is going to get a more detailed briefing on a specific programme of work which the department has set up under the banner of our sort of curriculum uh, um, and standards directorate to look at the whole area of continuity of learning. And it is a comprehensive program of work that looks across all of these issues. Um, you're right, look, we could get into a debate about the statistics, and I know we did, and interpretation of those statistics is quite dangerous because they are only a snapshot in time, and they do not represent the totality of online learning that is going on. I, I know you raised the point, and it's a very valid point, what we are doing to assure ourselves of the quality of what is happening by way of distance learning. Obviously, under normal circumstances, we would use the inspectorate to provide assurance on the quality of teaching and learning. We can't actually do that at the moment. We're not going to impose the burden of inspection on schools, and we can't go into hopes. But what we're doing is a twin-track approach to get assessment. In the questionnaire that goes out to schools every day, we did include information on distance learning to get some quantitative information about metrics and numbers and what's being used and where the gaps are. In addition to that, every school has a designated link officer who is talking to the schools and the school about their own practice in distance learning to give us qualitative feedback. And that is being used to inform our strategy in this approach. It's being used to baseline current provision, to identify where the gaps are, to identify what new issues we need to address. And that includes both quantifying the amount of or the number of digital devices that we feel we need, seeing whether we can resource those from existing schools and by repurposing C2K kit, and also to inform procurement strategy for the education authority who are looking at procuring a batch. And I think it's laptops as opposed to tablets, specifically for this purpose. You'll get more information, hopefully, by the end of the week, and then perhaps you would like a bespoke briefing on the whole issue of continuity of learning at a future, rather than just a general overview from myself, and I could get people who are more expert and knowledgeable than myself to brief the committee on this at a future meeting. Thank, thank, thank you, Derek. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, and uh, thanks for your answer. And I do appreciate that this is an entirely very complex situation, given that there are so many uh, influ influencing I I issues out there. Uh, in other words, a lack of rural broadband, uh, families that can't get access to 
a device, not that a device doesn't exist in a house, but in terms of yeah. numbers in the house, uh, getting access to a suitable device. Uh, I know that's an issue and it's one that has been raised with me. Uh, and I do understand as well, uh, regardless of the debate that will continue in relation to this, that there are still a significant number of children, in my opinion, who are of age and who should be engaging online and could access online that aren't accessing online. And that's where my concern lies. And, and I know you appreciate that and I appreciate your offer to uh, expand on that further and provide a, a more detailed update. Uh, it is an issue of concern, not just for me, but for principals and teachers out there who are under pressure in these circumstances, uh, and they're doing great work, and I just put on the record my thanks to them as well. Just a final point, Derek, uh, uh, and Chair, if you'll indulge me. Uh, the, the budget shortfall and it was discussed yesterday in the Assembly again, and it's, and, and it's a figure that's well noted at this stage, 165 million pounds. It's a very worrying figure. Gary Fair told us last week that the DE budget decisions had not yet been finalised. Uh, are you able to tell us, Derek, setting aside bids that may come through by a later monitoring rounds, how will you or the Minister be able to balance the budget with such a massive shortfall as £165 million? Are you expecting the bids to be successful? Are there conversations going on? Uh, just update us to give us some reassurance in relation to that, because I'm very concerned about such a significant shortfall? Yeah, well, I'm very concerned too, uh, as you might imagine, as the accounting officer. Um, yeah. I mean, all, all, I can, all, all I can tell you at this stage is that there are detailed conversations going on within the department and with the minister specifically on the budget allocations. Um, I have to say the budget outcome for the department was actually better than at one stage I anticipated it might be, so it's not as bad yeah. as it could have been. Um, we cannot anticipate that there will be more bids met in year, given the massive amounts of money that the executive is having to pay out to deal with the COVID-19 crisis. And I think we have to operate on that basis. But um, I, I, I will, unfortunately, Daniel, have to be a little bit coy because the minister has to make his final allocation decisions. Yeah. And I think those are imminent. And obviously, the committee will be made aware of those in due course. And I think, I mean, the committee is pretty familiar with our budget allocations line by line by line. And the committee will be updated once the minister has made his allocation decisions. Yes, yes, I, I appreciate that. And, and Chair, I just forgot one final supplementary point, uh, and it, it's to uh, the previous conversation we had with. with you, would have, you would have made a good minister, Daniel. And, 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 one one and, and final, and, final mark. It's in relation to, I don't get speaking to anyone that often, Chair. It's in relation to um, the, the, uh, the discussion we had this morning uh, about getting money uh, rolled out to the childcare sector. And obviously, you're uh, very uh, clear on the uh, challenges that uh, is being faced and um, the pace at which uh, things are being rolled out is generally an issue because. We, we, we're, we're all facing this crisis and all the departments are uh, impacted uh, in various ways. But I, I know, Derek, the Minister and yourself will appreciate as well as the department the importance of getting funds rolled out as quickly and as swiftly as possible. And that was confirmed this morning and there was clarification provided as to why it has taken uh, a number of weeks to get to where we are today. But my concern going forward, uh, and I pose this question, is in relation to resources in processing applications that are received and how quickly they can get out. And I was a wee bit alarmed to hear that there's only five staff in the BSO that will be uh, processing these applications. Uh, that gives me considerable concern. It gives concern to um, uh, the sector out there and to parents and others, and it will have an impact if this is to linger for weeks. So I'm just asking that uh, uh, attention could be given to ensure that that's a swift process and that money can get out as quickly as possible. Okay. I mean, I, I, heard, I heard your comments at the end of the last session, and the point is well made and well taken. Um, we, as I said, we will provide progress updates to the committee on this. But we will look at the resourcing issue in the light of the volume of work. And as Elish, I think, said, if more resources are needed, we will look at that, including the possibility of deploying Department of Education resources, if that could be done. The whole system is trying to move people around to where they're needed into unexpected areas where work was never needed before and new areas of work popped up. So we will keep that under active review. Okay, that's you, Daniel. Okay. Um, Thank you, Chair. Derek, you, Derek. Can, I, can I just just confirm then the Department of Education and the Education Authority are 
scoping the provision of internet and devices to pupils to support distance learning? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Chair. Um, Derek, thank you for once again being in front of the committee, or even on teleconference, um, for the availability of yourself and the Minister and your departmental officials. Uh, I haven't been in this committee before, but if we can maintain this uh, sort of pace post-COVID, it would be marvellous. Um, just want to thank the other committee members. I think you genuinely have covered a lot of the bases um, and those priorities in and around the SEN, supply teacher money, and the return to school dates. I'm just going to ask uh, one question, Derek, and it's something I've contacted, I think, both yourself and the Minister on, and that is to do with annual report writing um, for teachers and that guidance that's required. I believe that the, um, there's certainly been representation made by the, the rep bodies and EA to the Department for guidance on this. And it probably ties in with what Daniel was talking about too, because I have a real fear that particular disadvantaged kids are losing out uh, on elements of their education at the moment. And part of that we can't and won't be able to fix in the short term. So this ties in with the report writing. Uh, and I'm con very conscious, having spoke to a number of head teachers, that obviously they, uh, for a, a, an accurate report, they can only report on the achievements and application and abilities up until perhaps March the, the 20th. And anything after that, I don't think would be particularly fair across the, the, the whole uh, school uh, portfolio, if you like. So could you give us any update today with regard to any work that has been done and providing direction as soon as possible for our schools with regard to annual report writing? Yes, indeed. You're right. I mean, obviously, we have had correspondence on this issue. Uh, submission has gone to the minister on this issue with a recommendation. I... I Forgive me, uh, my memory fades. I can't remember whether the Minister has taken a decision now on what to do and whether that has issued. The Minister is very quick, usually, at taking decisions and clearing submissions, so I, I'll assume he has them. So I, th I think the short answer is yes, we have given consideration to this. It's with the Minister. I suspect the decision has been taken, and we'll be communicating with schools very quickly about this issue. Do you know what I'm a bit afraid of is telling you what that answer is because I would probably <laughs> get it wrong. I would probably get it wrong and give you a false stare, which would be unforgivable. But I think in general terms, the recommendation was in and around giving schools a bit more latitude in this area, given the very difficult circumstances that all schools are facing. And I hope I'm not preempting a ministerial decision by saying that. <laughs> Well, I just, just on that, I, I would appreciate that if that is the direction the Minister takes. I think what, what has become evident in the sector over this whole crisis is the level of innovation um, and uh, how, how good that our, our, our teachers and our support workers have been at meeting the needs, and they're complex and different needs in, in different parts of Northern Ireland, um, but they have shown a real aptitude for innovation. That, I think that would be some kind of a reward um, in terms of for the teachers to have that flexibility. Um, and ownership of it. And there's a real pressure here, I suppose, because one of the other things that I'm getting from, from teachers is they've never had more communication from parents than this. So traditionally, you maybe have the, you know, the parent-teacher meeting either once or twice a year, depending on the school, and that might be, for some kids, the, the, the level of contact. However, teachers are communicating with parents on a daily basis, and parents are now seeing the challenges and different things manifesting in their kids. Um, so I think this, would, this is a really important issue, and I appreciate that answer. Derek, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Catherine Kelly. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Derek, for meeting with us again this week. Um, yesterday, I spoke with Alan from Children in NA in relation to parents of children with disabilities who have been phoning their parent line helpline for the past few weeks about the lack of learning materials and school interventions. Um, parents are extremely frustrated at the lack of educational and developmental support from some schools um, for their children. Uh, children and young people are feeling isolated, lonely and sad um, with having their normal school routine disrupted and not having seen their friends in weeks, um, which is heartbreaking. Could the department maybe offer games of group practice um, to special schools? Um, parents would welcome school leaders where possible 
um, to facilitate the likes of Zoom calls with classes so that children and young people can connect with their friends. Um, social isolation for children and young people, um, as we know, is detrimental. Um, and we need to do more to ensure there is consistent support. Um, in the department's notes for this week, it mentions that there is no evidence that some special schools have not distributed learning materials to pupils and to bring forward any specific issues. On this, I would urge the department to speak to Alan and Polly from Children in NA as they are hearing issues contrary to this on a daily basis. Okay. Um Specifically, I'll pick up on the concerns that you have expressed to me about the availability of resources. Generally, I would go back to the continuity of learning program of work that we have, because within that, one of the specific work streams focuses on special schools. Yeah. And it's not just about continuity of learning, it's also about pastoral care and well-being for all the children. But I will relay that into that program of work so it is picked up generally as a point as well. Can, sorry, Catherine, I didn't quite hear you at the start. Which organisation has been in touch with you to express these concerns? Children in NA, um, Alan Finley and, and Pauline Leeson. All right, yes, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I know Pauline. Yeah, OK, thank you. So I'll pick up the specific point, but I'll relay it into the more general program of work on continuity of learning. Derek, also um, on, on a similar vein, um, some mums and dads explain to Parently that they are being actively discouraged from sending their children to school. Um, and, and one special school has listed on their website um, additional barriers, such as, and I quote, only children with both parents working as key workers and both parents out of work at the same time should consider attending school. In single parent families, the individual parent must be a key worker. This is stressing parents out at a time when they, they need more support. Is this acceptable practice? Well, actually, the both parents issue does not accord with our own policy on this. So I will look into that issue uh, for you, um, because that is not departmental policy in terms of uh, key workers. It just isn't. So that should not be the case. Thanks, thanks Derek. And, and, and one last point, um, Chair. Um, in relation to the Eat Well, Live Well programme that Kieran has mentioned, it's my understanding that the registration process for the programme has now been suspended. Um, I would urge the department to ensure everything possible is done to increase capacity. As to many of our vulnerable young people, this programme is a real lifeline. Okay, as I explained earlier, I mean the programme was originally targeted on 3,100 young people, and they have been effectively reached out to with over 30,000 meals provided every week. That's yeah. a breakfast and a main meal for every day, or yeah. for five days a week for each child. Now, you are right that they have reached capacity within the availability of the funding, um, yeah. so we need to look at that with the Education Authority. But um, without additional funding going into that program, and that funding would have to come from somewhere else, um, we can't keep growing and growing and growing it beyond the initial targeted group. But we are looking at that issue with the Education Authority to see what might be done and what is possible. But I, I wouldn't give any guarantees, because yeah. if, if, if we put more money into that program, we're taking it off something else. And that's just the stark reality for us. Thank you, Derek. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Catherine. And Derek, I think that emphasises the need to further establish the extent of the educational, social and health care support that is being provided to uh, children with special educational needs and complex needs at home. I'm just noticing from the data that you provide us that the number of children with statement of special educational needs attending mainstream schools is as low as 84, and the number of children with statement of special educational needs attending special schools is 15. So Correct. we have children with statements of special educational needs 
and also complex needs, um, socially isolated in numbers across Northern Ireland. Um, so we, we really need to get on top of the extent to which they're being supported in their education and uh, care at home. And I think that's why we keep asking you about this, um, uh, as Catherine has done today and as I've done with regards to the multidisciplinary panels. So uh, it's an issue that we, we hope to get further update on uh, in due course. Can I bring in Morris Bradley, please? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And thank you very much, Derek, for your presentation and your answers. Uh, I think an awful lot has been covered already. Uh, just, just one question about the substitute teachers. Have you a contingency plan in place so that uh, funding uh, is made available either from the Treasury or through the internal budget that you can roll the scheme out almost immediately? Yes, we've been looking at the administrative arrangements so that whatever level of funding is available, we would be able to administer it. Um, we haven't been sitting on our hands in that regard. That's, that's, that's brilliant, Derek. Thank you very much. The other question, a couple of questions, uh, if I saw right to you, Chair. Uh, yes. school, school transport. Could you provide more clarity whether the, the, the department will look at the fuel costs, as fuel costs are not an earning but an expense. And if a wee bit more clarity whether you're going to pay for the fuel costs or deduct the fuel costs. Sorry, I'm... So, Marcy, I'm not... Marcy, are you asking if uh, school uh, transport and fuel costs incurred by schools will be deducted from their expenditure? given the lack of school transport and operation? That's correct, Chair. Derek? Sorry, I, I, I'm not altogether sure about the question whether school transport costs will be deducted from schools' budgets. Is that what you're asking? No, no. no. Uh, through you, Chair. Uh, the school transport, the, 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 the budget that's going to be uh, allocated there yeah. has been no deduction for fuel costs, which are an expenditure and not an earning. And I'm just wondering, is the department going to pay in full the full cost of school transport through buses and taxis, or are they going to deduct the fuel costs? Yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure what we would be paying. I mean, free school, school transport obviously is not currently operating at all, okay. But we have already committed to paying contractors, and I think you've got some correspondence on that, and it was referenced at the start of the of the meeting that contracts are being honoured in full. I think in the round, as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, there will be swings and roundabouts in terms of additional costs and indeed some windfall savings that will be um, incurred over the life of this. But we don't quite know what the extent of all of those are at the moment, and that will only become clearer as time progresses. But I, I'm sorry, I'm still not 100% sure about the intent of the question. Um, forgive me for being obtuse on this point. It's all right. Uh, you've said you'll honour 100% the contract. Yeah. But so there is no school transport taking place at the minute. Surely that contract would have incorporated within it fuel costs. It would. Yeah. It would. I mean, it, you know, our contract, the Education Authority's contract, for example, with TransLink for the provision of home to school transport and free home to school transport for 100,000 children would have been an overall cost which will take into account lots of things including fuel. But my understanding is those, those contracts are being fully honoured. We're not deducting anything off them at this stage. But I would need to confirm that point. Okay. That's okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Morris. Can I, can I, oh, can I continue, Chair? Yeah, give you a final question. We're just we're being beat by time here in terms of access to the room. Can you get a final question, Morris? Final question, and I'll make it brief, Chair. Uh, what progress has been has made with the CPEA on the appeals process, considering results will be exam-based, but 
based on a calculation, how can that calculation, for instance, be reassessed in an acute situation? Is there, is there any, any further clarity on that? The edu sorry, CCEA, CCEA intends to consult on an appeals process, and I'm expecting that consultation to start later this week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Morris. Justin McNulty. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Derek, and to your colleague, John, for speaking with us again and for your openness and frankness. Derek, what's your understanding of the two different uh, key work areas from the Department of Health and the Department of Education? Well, my understanding is the same of your, as yours. Maybe you're asking what my opinion is. Um, I mean, and you've had that explanation, and the um, arrangements have been signed off by both ministers. So that's it. And uh, I can understand why the two schemes are different because they're for slightly different purposes. Now, I didn't hear the full session earlier on childcare, but my understanding is that as time progresses and we gather experience on the childcare arrangements, that we will keep under review the key worker definition for the childcare support arrangements. But that will depend on the light of experience and our ability to accommodate a wider group of children. Okay, thanks, Derek. Tommy, uh, go back, going back on to substitute teachers, seven weeks in for the Department of Finance and the Department of Education to write to Treasury. Were you not aware of this issue until now? Well, it, it didn't take us seven weeks to, to write to Treasury. We wrote to Treasury some time ago, and there were other processes at play trying to work through the executive. As you will appreciate, the executive had a massively long list of bids and continues to have a long list of bids in front of it, which far exceed the resources available to deal with the COVID-19 emergency. Now, the executive has been working through all of these issues. We came up with a potential alternative arrangement, which is based on the use of furloughing. I have to say it does not fit with the rules on furloughing, which have been applied at a national level. So we are asking for some derogation from that so it's applying a bit of imagination to this, and it's on that basis that we wrote to Treasury. But I think it's wrong to say that we sat on our hands for eight weeks and did nothing. We have been pursuing this issue, but the avenues that we have gone down did not prove fruitful. So we have tried one last avenue on an imaginative application of the furloughing arrangement. Yeah, well, that, that won't provide much comfort for those people who are struggling financially and who bills to pay and families to feed, uh, Derek, you know, the, the department saying they're being imaginative is not going to be giving them much confidence. Um, Tally, should, should the Department of Education be paying for internet for teachers who are um, delivering home learning for their pupils? At this stage, no. Uh, we have no plans to do so. If you're saying, should we pay for it, that would be yet more money we'd have to find from a budget that is £165 million over committed. I have no idea where the money would come from. But I don't think we're in the business of paying for private um, internet access to private homes. Um, that's a totally new front we'd be opening up, and there are no plans to consider that at present. Yeah, well, it's, it's a little bit different now, Jack. It's not just private. It's their, their fulfilling their, their teaching role through their, their home internet. So there is a bit of crossover here. Um, but I understand that the budgets are very much um, stressed. Um, what has the impact of austerity on the significant cuts in frontline education had on schools' ability to deliver home online learning, especially in large class sizes, lack of money to purchase ICT resources, and lack of CPD? What has the impact of austerity had on the ability to enter this new normal in terms of delivering, delivering education? Uh, that would be an exceptionally difficult question to answer. We all know that schools have been under financial pressure for quite a number of years. Um, but if you're asking me to define in some kind of precise way the impact of that on delivering distance learning, I couldn't even begin to do so. What I will say, and it's a point made by, I think, your colleague earlier, 
I think schools have risen magnificently to the challenge and are showing great innovation in applying distance learning. Um, and I think they're doing the very best they can within the resources available. But um, I think the impact of uh, financial stress on schools has been felt over many years, but it's not within my gift to um, remedy that instantly at present. I'm sorry. We are where we are with school budgets, and we're operating as best we can within the overall resource available. Okay, thanks, Derek. In terms of the educational gap potentially widening um, because of the impact of COVID-19 on, on the education, um, I would very much welcome a detailed briefing in terms of the continuity of learning, and what's proposed and how to um, reboot the education system is put in special focus on those people who may have been left behind because of their own particular circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I think, sorry, I, I, I think that's a very valid point. And, you know, as we are looking ahead and scoping the kinds of issues that will need to be addressed uh, when schools return to some uh, degree of normality, the focus on uh, catching up and supporting those pupils who may have been disproportionately disadvantaged during this period will be a key component of that work in terms of targeting particular cohorts. So I think it's a valid point. We aren't yet there yet in terms of having a firm strategy for when schools return, but it's certainly in our line of sight and something that we'll be giving serious consideration to over the coming weeks. Okay, Derek, I'd like to pay tribute to you and your departments um, in terms of the, you're constantly firefighting here. I appreciate the, the, the struggle, but I know, I know you're endeavouring to make the, make the amends, make things work as best as possible. And I also want to pay tribute to principals, teachers, support staff, parents, and pupils who are making enormous efforts to restructure and refocus on education during this unprecedented time of crisis. And I'll finish off by reading a short email which was sent to me. I won't mention the school, I won't mention the names, I'll put in the names, but this is an email that came into a principal of a school. Mr. Uh, dear principal and all the staff, both my husband and I would like to thank you for all the support, dedication, and most importantly, concern and sincerity you have shown to all the children during this very difficult time. Both Jack and Jill are working very hard but are missing their friends and teachers. We are not in any way surprised by the attention to detail and duty of care demonstrated by all the staff at all at times like this, we are extremely grateful to be part of the school family. Hoping you're all keeping safe and well, and we wait in anticipation to meet you all again. So I think that's brilliantly encapsulates the efforts that school leaders, teachers, and staff, and parents and pupils are going to. So I have to applaud them massively. Okay, Justin, just a little cameo point on that. Uh, I agree entirely. I know the school you're talking about. It's built on the pitch where I used to play football as a kid growing up in Uri <laughs> without giving any tips. But, so there you go. Uh, and I agree, I agree entirely with the sentiments that you've expressed and those parents have expressed. That individual principal has been in touch with me about a wide range of issues very helpfully about schools returning, and I will revert to that school principal. Thank you very much, Derek. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks, Derek. Uh, Derek, in conclusion, um, thank you again for your attendance today. COVID-19 is obviously demanding much of our schools, everyone in our education sector, our, our children and young people and our, our families. Um, we are, are grateful for the, the work that you're doing to try to help them and support them through that. Um, unless you have any other final comments, we will follow up issues raised today and um, engage with you again next week. That's fine, Chair. Thank you very much, and thank you to the committee for your time. Thanks, Derek. All the best. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, members, I'll, I'll ask the clerk to summarise actions from our evidence sessions today and, and then close the meeting promptly thereafter. Okay, members, if you're still with me then, um, I think the uh, just in terms of the briefing you've just had, I think the committee wants to write to the departments um, seeking an update on the work of the interdisciplinary panel and its impact on SEN. 
Um, secondly, we're looking for information on the number of families who are entitled to but have not received the uh, free school meal payments. Now, perhaps also uh, the committee could just uh, explore with the department around the question of eligibility, eligibility and entitlement. Um, for those who are, say, on universal credit are um, eligible, whereas those who've actually applied um, are entitled. I think that's Robin's dog. <laughs> right. uh, so if members are content with that, um, additionally then, um, we're writing to the department just seeking a further explanation on why the free school meal money can't be paid in the form of a cheque. Uh, and then um, linked to the uh, interdisciplinary panel, we're just also seeking a further update on the role of educational psychologists and the impact on statementing. Now there's something on this at page 63 at table items, but I think members want a bit more. Uh, we're writing to the department asking for a briefing on continuity of learning. Um, we're also um, asking around um, the question that um, I think uh, Ms Kelly asked about special schools and um, the uh, uh, provision of uh, information for um, uh, children uh, to support distance learning. And then um, finally, I think the committee, are they saying that they would encourage the department, if they can, to uh, increase support for the youth service and the, the, the food service um, that it's providing in lieu of uh, free school meals? Is that like a fair summary of uh, the second briefing we had there? Members agreed? Great. Agreed. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Then, and in terms of the um, childcare briefing, then, so writing to DE and DOH. Firstly, I think on the point that Mr. McCrossan made about um, urgently seeking a timescale for payments. I'm wanting that before the end of the week, and also seeking an update, an urgent update about the uh, BSO staffing um, situation or to process said payments. Additionally, then the committee is asking for as the Permanent Secretary undertook there. To, uh, they're asking for uh, the weekly update to include more information on the uh, childcare package and how that is being rolled out. Um, just stress the important. Uh, try and get the detail around the numbers of applications that can be processed for the BSO. Five, five members of staff is not sufficient. They were looking to give that figure. They eventually obviously provided it to us, but I, I think that uh, we need to be pushing very hard at this. They need to be uh, uh, deploying extra resources to get this out as swiftly as possible. Okay, and they'll okay. be able to work that out because they'll know how long it takes to roll out these um, applications. Okay. Okay. Um, so then, uh, additionally, uh, we're, we're looking for a, a weekly update as well as that, uh, but um, suggest maybe that the committee asks the uh, Department of Health for a one-pager which would compare the different child care packages. Uh, the reason I'm saying it is it sounded like um, officials in DUH have done this because they seem to be quoting that and they were able to compare with uh, the Republic of Ireland. Um, thirdly then, um, in line with the question that uh, Ms Kelly had also asked about um, guidance on um, childcare settings which are closed, where the staff are providing home childcare and whether this actually does uh, rule um, that setting out of getting support. And uh, then we're also seeking um, an update uh, when it's available on the Vulnerable Children Action Plan. So again, members, hopefully that's a fair summary of the uh, actions from the first briefing. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Sorry, sir, I apologise, I thought I had the phone muted when the dog started barking. <laughs> it, it, it's a, it's a, a feature of uh, COVID-19 Assembly Education Committee meetings. <laughs> We're going to have to meet this dog eventually, Robin. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, agenda item nine then, members, is any other business? Can I um, raise a proposal that we invite a deputation of children and young people from the Northern Ireland Youth Forum to uh, to uh, meet with the committee further to their Northern Ireland wide survey of children and young people and the challenges they're facing um, further to the COVID-19 outbreak. Members can tell. Great. Great. Chair, could I, could I just uh, mention if we're going to have uh, a youth uh, giving uh, updates to do we not need to look at the youth sector in the wider context rather than just coming from one group? 
open open the day on that, Robin. If you want to suggest some organisations, I, I, I think Northern Ireland Youth Forum has conducted this bespoke piece of work pertinent to COVID nineteen. But I, I'm I'm content to receive suggestions for um, for other engagement with other organisations. Um, well, Go ahead, Chair. Maybe if we could ask the Secretary, I'm sorry, ask the, the committee clerk to give us a list of uh, youth groups that are operating in the field and who may have uh, a contribution to make to the situation. Okay. Are you content for us to go ahead with the Northern Ireland Youth Forum invitation, but to seek um, that list for further engagement, Robin? Well, I'd rather I'd rather get a holistic view of the sector, Chair, rather than just get a view from from one organisation, because we I think we've had them before, haven't we? We we have in relation to youth services funding, but I'm at I'm at pains to emphasise here that that the rationale for this is because the Northern Ireland Youth Forum have uh, conducted a survey of young people across Northern Ireland in relation to their experiences in COVID-19 and, and questions that they would raise um, from that. So I, I think there is justification for proceeding okay. with that particular session. But okay. well, then if, if we would do that other piece of work in terms of the... Absolutely. The, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Members members agreed? Okay. Can, okay. I, yeah. can, I, can I in closing thank members for the work um, that has been done this week, particularly in relation to early education and childcare? The Assembly and Assembly Committees are often criticised at times for our scrutiny or our support for departments, but um, I'm grateful for the work that members have done this week, particularly in relation to these urgent issues. Um, I'm very uh, grateful for it, so I'd like to thank you in that regard. Um, our, our date, time and place of next meeting then is Wednesday the 13th of May in room 29 at 9.15 a.m. Uh, committee meeting does now adjourn. Thank you, members. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29.